Okay, so just uh, let me welcome you to, uh, to this uh, session, uh, Developing the Next Gen Scientist, the Role of Course-Based Research in the Undergraduate uh, Curriculum. Uh, the session is intended to provide uh, insights into opportunities and challenges for, for introducing and integrating research uh, experiences across the undergraduate uh, scientific uh, curriculum. Uh, we have five excellent speakers this afternoon, so without further ado, uh, I'll introduce Lee Hughes from the University of North Texas, who's going to tell us about advanced research courses for undergraduates, a win for students, a win for faculty. Good afternoon. So just as a quick overview of what I uh, will plan to cover this uh, on this presentation. I'll talk just a little bit about cures. I'm hopeful that most of you already know what they are, but, but just a little brief introduction on those. Uh, and then I'll talk some about the, the student benefits, and then I'll focus mostly on uh, benefits for faculty and, and why these are good things for us to be involved in. So CURES stands for Course-Based Undergraduate Research Experiences. And these offer students an opportunity to experience scientific inquiry and authentic research within a class setting. And just a few definitions to make sure we're all on the same page. So when we're talking about scientific inquiry, um, we're talking about you know, studies of the natural world and um, activities that are going to propose explanations based on the evidence. And, and then when we talk about authentic research with students, um, we're looking at things that let them be doing the things that a real scientist is doing, right? So they're doing hypothesis formation, they're doing experimental design, data collection analysis, all those things that we do culminating in a publication or presentation. When we're doing this within the class setting, um, I always say that one of my goals when I do this with students is it's real science. The students don't know the answer and neither do I. We're doing this real experimentation looking for a, 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 a real um, exploration and, and data analysis to try to figure out what the answers might be to that study. And so I think that's, that's incredibly important that it's not something where we're kind of you know, sneaking behind them saying, oh, well, we know the answer, but you don't, right? It's, they really are exploring and, and they are discovering. So I wanted to just get a quick raise of hands. If you've used authentic inquiry um, in your classes or inquiry-based activities, could you just give me a... a Raise of hands, awesome, awesome, very good. So a lot of you there have already done that, so that's, that's really wonderful. So the first thing is, you know, what do students gain out of this? And, and, and what's, what's in it for them? How do they win in, in, uh, in this context? And, and we know that, that these sorts of experiences are, are much more engaging when they're working on, on a research setting, um, and that's gonna help them, you know, boost retention, it's gonna boost their interest, um, and keep them engaged in science. It also gives them experiment, experience in the process of science. So they're doing what a scientist does in, in that setting, as well as learning skills. They're learning the technical skills necessary to do the kind of work that they're doing. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this point because there's a, a tremendous amount of, scientific, of, of literature showing the benefits for undergraduate research. Um, if, if you're not familiar with that literature, there are a couple of really good places to start. You can, um, the, the uh, society has the Journal of Biology and Microbiology Education, I think I said that backwards, Microbiology and Biology Education, um, which has a lot of, of, of uh, reports. Um, there's, there's the current issue of the um, uh, CBE Life Sciences Journal has a number of reports uh, showing some recent studies about research experiences for undergraduates. So there's a lot of uh, things out there that you can look at if, if you would like to know more about how students benefit. Now, that's research in general. Now, we also talk about specifically doing it in classes. There's a large growing number of cures, courses that are um, giving these research experiences to students. And these give us a chance to take the classroom experience and, and connect it to real science, which is wonderful. But the other, I think, big advantage for cures um, is that they are connecting more students to research. If, if I want to work with students in the, um, in my laboratory, um, you know, I'm going to be limited by space, by equipment, all kinds of things that are going to keep me from being able to take probably more than a handful a year into, into my research lab. 
if I do it in a class, I can, I can do that to a much larger number of students at the same time. And it's, a, it, it's saving, um, saving me time retraining them all individually as well. So there's a, there's a lot of uh, advantages to putting them there, but mainly more of them are getting a chance to participate. And so that's one of the, the big advantages of doing in the classroom setting versus the more traditional apprentice model. But what I want to focus more on is what do we get out of it, right? I mean, why is this important? Not only because it's a good thing for students is a great reason to do it, but it usually takes a little more convincing um, that it's worth our time to do it and, and to spend that, that effort for, for our particular um, you know, time frame when we've got so many different things we need to do as faculty members and so many different demands on our time. Um, one new, you know, another new course prep, you know, trying to put all that together, what, is, what does that do for us? And so how can we use that uh, to our best advantage um, so that we can benefit our students that way? So the first thing I want to mention is there's often this idea that there's a false dichotomy between what we do as scientists and what we do as educators. And Many, many faculty, I think, feel that those are two totally separate things that they're doing um, in, their, in their jobs, and, and many of their graduate students feel the same way. And those are the, the people we're training, and they're coming up, and they're learning the same thing. And, and they see either teaching is something that they might enjoy doing, but it's totally separate work from what they're doing in, in their laboratory, or they see it as an extra burden um, that's keeping them from the lab. So there's lots of different uh, aspects, but they often see these as very separated. Um, and I want to say that I don't really think that's true or doesn't need to be true, because there's, there's things that we can do to incorporate not only our research into our teaching, where we take things we know as a researcher and bring that to students in our courses, which is very important, and then we also teach the same way we do our science by using evidence-based strategies and all that, which is important. But we can also um, bring teaching into our research, and, and, and that's a little bit about what I want to talk about. So we can, we can take our courses and through course-based undergraduate research experiences, we can bring those students to our lab, essentially, in a, in a, in a way. Bring them to our science. And, and some advantages of this right off the bat is what is the thing you know best in the world, right? Your science. And so it gives you a chance to teach from what you know best. So you can take that information. You're also going to be the most passionate because you've chosen to build your, your career around this topic. Um, and so that science that you're, that you're doing is going to help you um, get your passion to the, to the students by bringing them into that science. And then another advantage is if, if, uh, if the science that you do is, is amenable to it, you can actually get students to help you advance your research by being data collectors, by being data analyzers. Um, and and there's, a, there's different level, levels and different ways that students can do this that can be important to helping us as scientists advance our science as well by working with students. So there's a couple of ways that you can get involved in this, and let's touch on these uh, briefly. And um, you, depending on where you are, what kind of institution you're at, um, what other uh, training and resources you have available to you, um, you, you might want to join uh, an existing cure type program, um, and I'll mention a few of those in a moment. Or if, if you really want to work on your specific science in a way that, that doesn't exist out there already, um, you can create your own cure and build it around your particular uh, science background. So if, if you just choose to do something that's already pre-existing, there's a number of advantages there that'll save you some of that time of developing the new prep. Um, and those programs already have a lot of protocols that you can just you know, plug right into and start using fairly quickly. Um, they will train you. In many cases, they provide training on how to do it. And there's, a, there's at least some sort of support system or maybe an infrastructure backing up the data collection and, and the training there that you can, that you can use. Um, just some things to think about when you're doing this. You want to pick carefully to something that you can match with. And, and um, so several of the ones I'm going to talk about are very connected to microbiology. So for most microbiologists, you can, you can connect into those pretty easily. Um, some are going to have limited numbers of opportunities to join, so maybe once a year when they offer the training and they accept new programs or new, new institutions of the program. Um, there's, there's going to be some expectations on you and that you need to be willing to, to, uh, 
to fulfill whatever expectation the program may have uh, for, for you to provide to them. Um, and the one thing that we talk about connecting to the science is the science is probably already decided if there's an existing program of some kind. So when you're joining them, you need to be interested in, in being part of that particular program. And some examples of, of these, uh, the CFAGES program, which uh, Graham uh, has, has, uh, has led, and uh, Genomics Education Partnership, the Small World Initiative. These are all some of the existing cures that are out there. And uh, many of these start students early in their, in their academic career, but um, you can also connect uh, students later in the academic career, which is, I'll, I'll mention a little bit later again. Now, if you really want to go out and, and you want to do your own thing because that's the science you have and the way you want to do it, that's great. And I'll talk about how uh, I've done that at my institution. Um, you, in this case, you're in charge of everything. So you've got to have the expertise and the training. But you're setting the research agenda, which is also important because you, you, you're taking the science where you want it to go. Um, you need to make sure that, that, that you understand how that's going to work with students and, and undergraduates. Than it, than it might work when you're training graduate students or, or others in your field. Um, and make sure that you're going to have the, the right um, facilities and the right materials and the right protocols that are going to work with those students. So it takes a little bit more work to do it this way, but it can be uh, very fulfilling if you do it. So I'm going to give you a little bit of background on how I got into some of these programs and, and talk about the programs that I'm working with. Um, I have my PhD uh, working with primitive metabolism and streptomyces, and then I was in a uh, non-research kind of roles for a number of years after I, I earned that. And then I had the opportunity to, to move into a small research lab um, in 2007, and shortly thereafter, uh, my institution joined the CFAGES program. And so as a consequence of joining that program, I got really interested in, in expanding opportunities for, for, for cures at my institution. And, and one of my concerns was we would have this great freshman experience, and then they would have nothing after that for the remaining three years that really connected them in the same way. So I wanted things for them to, to look forward to and to move into. And so um, we received an HHMI science education grant. And as part of that grant, we proposed to develop advanced research courses um, at my institution. And those, we call call them the classroom-based research laboratories, the facility they're taught in, and also what we call them CRL courses. And we started the first one of those, uh, was taught in 2010. And then um, in that same time period, I started doing more and more of the, streptom of, of the phages uh, work with, in my lab, but I started going back to my original, the host I'd worked with previously, which was streptomyces. And so by 2011, we're really starting to, to try to move that direction uh, of phage research forward. And I uh, offered my first advanced research course in that area in, in uh, 2013. Um, offered an advanced bacteriophage genetics uh, course for my students. And so the, the CRL courses are taught in the classroom that we, uh, laboratory that we renovated as part of our, with some of our grant funds. Um, this is set up as a three credit hour course that is taught twice a week for three hours each because you need big blocks of time for students to do the research in. And we worked it out so that it's actually set up as an advanced biology laboratory elective in our department. So our students have to have so many advanced courses with labs and they could use this course as one of those. And we got it into the curriculum as a course with varying topics called advanced research in lab sciences. And I think that's really important if you're, if you're trying out these things and you have the opportunity to, to, to get them into your curriculum because it, it makes it easier for students to register for them because they know how it's going to count in the degree. There's no fuzziness about, well, it's a special topic, something that nobody knows where it actually fits. And, and I think it's really important to, to, to tie that directly into the curriculum. Um, and, and it also gives it some permanence that, that you want. And so we were able to do that with the Biology 3900 course. Now, I have a little asterisk at the top because this is a double win for us because the students now have credit that goes towards their degree in an identifiable fashion. They know exactly where it's going to fit into their biology major. But this is a regular course in our teaching load. So it's counting as my teaching load when I teach it and my other faculty member uh, partners that do this. And so we're, it's not one more extra thing that we're trying to do because we think it should be done. It's something that's part of our load as well. So I think that's important to note um, because many times we get these things going, but it's always, our, our chair is happy to let us do it, but it's always extra. 
and it's not really part of your defined load. So I think that's, that's good as well. So once we uh, developed this, these courses, we have over time uh, taught five different topics. The very first one we did was systems microbiology. Um, uh, my colleague Michael Allen uh, taught that one uh, before he left for another institution. Um, and then since then, we've kept going uh, with developmental physiology, uh, plant cell uh, biology and biochemistry and molecular biology. That was a little too long to fit on there. Um, I did the advanced bacteriophage genetics and then environmental toxicology. And at this point in time, we have, we have taught almost all of these at least twice. Um, so it's permanent, it's rotating. We rotate through semester after semester. Um, and so we have now, you know, a small um, group of people at our institution who we can talk to each other about what worked and what didn't work. So we've got sort of that, that, uh, that support group as well um, for these. So that, I think that's well. And you can see this works with a lot of different kinds of research areas. I mean, you know, each course is taught completely differently, but each faculty member is tailoring it to their particular research area. Now, um, some of the other benefits that are, are not as, as um, uh, you know, credit related and those sorts of things is just the experience is, is really great because you get, to, you get to work with a dedicated group of students. They're there because they want to be. Uh, it's not that there's one more requirement they have to check off their degree. It's actually something they chose to be in. Um, and so you get this nice interaction. And actually, uh, one of my colleagues has said it's uh, the, the best teaching experience he's had in his career is this opportunity to work with these students. Um, and some of the other advantages as well is now you've got a group, we, we limit the course to 16 students, that's what the facility is basically designed to handle. And with, with those 16 students, um, you're, you're training them in your research area, essentially, and you're interesting them in your research. And so what it, it gives you some other, some other uh, benefits in the fact that now you've got students who, if they're not graduating immediately, because we have both juniors and seniors, and some are graduating immediately and some aren't, um, if they're going to be around for a little while, they're already trained to do a lot of what you do, so they could come in and continue doing that work after the semester, which almost all of us have had some students that continue at least a semester or more afterwards in, in our individual research. Not all of them can, but we wouldn't have room for all of them, unfortunately. Um, and at least uh, one of the faculty members has actually recruited new graduate students out of there. He, um, when the first time he taught it, he got two new PhD students, students who were right at the, they were about to graduate, and they became really highly interested in staying and working with him and are doing their PhDs with him now. Um, and then, of course, the other obvious benefit, if things are working the way they're supposed to, they're collecting data and analyzing it for you and making some progress towards your particular research um, agenda, which is great. Now, obviously, you're going to have to be careful in the kinds of projects that you give them, and you need to do it in a way that the data that they're working with is... is um, collectible by someone with little, a little bit of training. Um, but there are lots of things in, in, in different research projects that need that sort of work. And sometimes it's things that are highly repetitive. And it's fine for a semester. But if you were to, you know, a graduate student would burn out really fast if that's all they ever did, right? But a handful of, of undergraduates might like that for a semester, something that they spend six or eight weeks on. It's not the end of the world, you know, um, as far as that's all they've ever done or ever going to do. Um, and then hopefully, you know, some of that data becomes publishable. That's my ultimate goal is that, that this, these end up in publishable um, uh, forms. So I just want to give my personal example along those lines of, of, uh, of, the, of that data. So when we, you know, as I said earlier, when I started the CFAGES program, um, I had a small research lab that I was still kind of trying to figure out what direction I was going to take it, continue my PhD sort of area or not. And so I kind of just spent a little bit of time giving students opportunities to do research. I didn't take grad students immediately. Um, and then as CFAGES started, I thought, well, hey, let's try some streptomyces phages. And, and we started doing that isolation a little bit in the lab. You know, it took a while to get everything working well. And then at some point, we said, why aren't we just doing this in our classes? And so we switched over from the mycobacterium host to the streptomyces host. And so this is, we've only been doing the, you know, that particular project um, in, my, in my CFAGES courses for the last two years. Um, but in that time, we've isolated over 100 streptomyces uh, phages by my undergraduate students. Um, almost all the isolation is happening in students at the freshman level. Um, some other students may be working in my research lab later, but mostly these are the freshmen doing the basic isolation. Um, 
And these numbers are just the things we've done at UNT. This is not things that, that, have, that have come from other sources in, the, in, that, um, in that group of data. 31 uh, finished genomes um, uh, have come out of, of our work. And 13 of those are already in GenBank, and uh, I think there's 14 of them sitting on my laptop waiting for me to finish quality controlling them. Um, we've so far published one genome announcement uh, f from this work, um, and my advanced research courses where it was really that bottom line there, talking about data analysis, because they've done a lot more in-depth look at some of these phages, and it's, it's taking a long time to do that work. It's much more complicated than the basic isolation and all of that, but, but we've got two clear groups of, of things that we've studied that I, that I think will be able to reach publication. You know, it's going to take some more work, and, 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 but I've got students who are really very interested in doing that and, and pulling those pieces of information together. Um, and so really, in my particular case, where even though I'm at a, I didn't really give you any context, but I'm at a, um, a very large public university. We have uh, about 37,000 students total. Um, our department has over 2,500 undergraduate majors, so it's a lot of, you know, a very, very large institution um, with um, uh, uh, high research activity, but I am not one of those people with the high research activity. I'm more focused on biology ed education research, um, not large science grants, and so this is a great way for me to have an active research lab at relatively low cost, but with I hope increasing productivity. So it's a it's a really nice synergy for me to be able to put those things together in in, in my particular context. So so I think that's that's uh, one of the things that that um, different people, different situations. You know, this that may or may not work as well for you, but it's it's been a, a really good thing for me. So I just wanted to 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 kind of wrap this up with. Um, an, an overview of uh, some of the things I mentioned. You know, the students we know are going to benefit from research experiences, but the the big feature of cures is they get to do those research experiences that they probably wouldn't have gotten to do, um, or only number, a handful of them would have gotten if we relied solely on apprentice-based and limited laboratory um, opportunities. Um, because of space and time. By bringing 16 students together in a classroom, um, now I've got that 16 students, probably 14 or 13 of them would not have gotten to come into my lab if I did it just as an individual invitation. Um, they're gonna be able to work together. You get to train them as a group rather than individually. Um, and so all, all of those students together, you can scale this now in a way that gives that benefit to lots of students. Um, for the faculty side, uh, you're able to com combine the efforts of your teaching and research in, in meaningful ways. Um, if, if you're wanting to bring more students in, even just the few that you want to bring in for individual um, research or graduate students that you want to bring in afterwards, um, you want to be able to recruit the best students to that, and these courses are a really good way of doing that as well. And then you have opportunities for um, undergraduates to contribute to science. They're producing publishable work, um, and, and they'll be, you know, uh, rise to the level of co-authors in many cases, and, and I think that's an invaluable experience for them as well. That gives you a publication as well, right? So it's, it's everybody's winning in that particular case. So um, I'm, I, I, I'm kind of thinking of a lot of this talk as cheerleader. I'm trying to cheer you on so that you come and start doing this as well. Um, I know uh, one of our later speakers is going to talk about uh, talking with faculty who do these sorts of things and, and her data on that. So I, uh, I look forward to hearing that as well later, Sarah. So just a, a quick um, acknowledgments of the people that uh, helped do this. Um, obviously, my co the other instructors uh, that, that teach these courses um, at UNT, Michael Allen's now at UNT Health Science Center, uh, Kent Chapman, Ed Jalowski, and Aaron Roberts are the people currently teaching. Um, uh, Howard Hughes uh, Science Education Grant uh, helped fund our CRL uh, course space, which is where we also teach our CFAGES students. And of course, CFAGES uh, for helping me get into cures in the first place and giving me a, a, a sort of a model for doing my own uh, versions of these. So um, that's everything I think I have and um, open for any questions. There's a mic. Yeah, There's a mic. There's a mic. Yeah, too. Yeah. yeah, you're good. Hi, I'm Mary Miller. I'm from Baton Rouge Community College, and we've actually implemented Small World Initiative into the classroom there. 
and I'm looking at ways to, you know, change it up a little bit. What types of decisions do your students get to make based on research in those projects that you prepare for them? Well, I, I can tell you that from the standpoint of um, how you set it up and how you move it forward, we've tried a little of everything as we're trying to feel our way through. Um, the first time I taught it, I will say it really turned into just an experimental design course where we spent the whole semester designing stuff <laughs> and really never got anything done because of that. So I defined things a little narrower the second and third times I taught. And, and so we started with here's the area we want to look at and here's things that you could do. And we didn't really tell them how to do them. They had to do that research and look up, here's the kinds of experiments that, that prove you know, this sort of, of evidence. Um, and so it, it became less about how do you design the experiments, but which ones do you need to do? Mm -hmm. And here's with, within that area, and then how do you get it done, and then you do it. And that fits a little better in one semester course than just, mm -hmm. here, what do you want to do? And, right. and uh, it was a little too broad early. So I've learned as I've gone along. but. Yeah, but I'm, give I'm them a, also, a focus area. Yeah. yeah, I'm a huge advocate for research in the classroom, and we're having the poster presentation tonight at 8 o'clock at the Trade Center. Uh, we've got 25 students presenting, so y'all stop by. You can get an idea of what the students do during yeah. these projects, because it's, it's amazing what they can come away with. So. And I think uh, you know, that's important to note that students, you think, oh, it's undergrads, right? Mm -hmm. But undergrads can produce amazing work when you give them the chance. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. And there was another question down here. So thank you. So my name is Li Jun from UMass Amherst. Uh, so I have two questions. One is more generic. You said we are interested to drawing the existing curves. Is that public um, database we can search for, which already developed? I, I know for um, for uh, CFages, there's uh, okay. you can if you go through HHMI and look up. See phages. The, there's, I think, the new application just opened up for the next for a year from now. Schools would start a year from now. Um, Small World also has a website with the information on applying. I don't know much about applying for genomics edu education partnership, but. So the second question is more related with your own development for the CR class. So you said you have several faculties rotating the same sort of the course. Mm -hmm. Do you share the same lab, or each class have its own lab study? I mean, I'm just curious to see how does rotation work. So we all use the same facility, the classroom research lab. Um, it's, it's essentially set up for microbiology and molecular biology type experiments, the basic stuff you would have in a, in a lab for that. So our developmental physiologist does take the students over to his own research lab in small groups for some of their experiments, and so does our toxicologist, but they use the same room for most of their meetings. And So, and, uh, so you and don't teach at the same time? So no, they're all teaching. We, right now we're just doing one of these a semester. Um, we actually have time in the schedule. We could, um, I had some talks recently with another faculty member we could add another one into the schedule. Can I just finish by asking, um, you said that the credit for taking the course counts towards their major. Mm -hmm. So is there some other requirement that it's replacing or, or another lab or some other requirement that it substitutes for? And is there a limit to how many they can take that will count towards the major? So, so what we do is um, our, our major has a couple of elective courses, advanced electives, and so that's, it's fulfilling one of those elective requirements. Um, as far as the 3,900 courses go, we only let them take one of them, partly because we want to spread, the, you know, spread it out to as many people, but that they can only take 3,900 once and use that in their actual degree plan. I have a couple questions, too. How do you um, expedite the IRB process? We try to do undergrad, I teach in a uh, medical lab science program, and trying to get that in one semester has just been a nightmare. Do you put them in under your own, or how do you do that? Well, I'm, so we don't have to get IRB because we're not studying the students well, in this case, but the students are just doing research in the lab. Yeah, for anything that's going to be outside that. And then the other thing, um, I guess that answers that you're not doing, you're only using the students are my researchers. If we do anything, like for example, even testing uh, like anaerobic plates, for example, with swab samples from 
from anything other than inanimate, we have to have IRB approval. Well, we're not collecting human samples in my research either, so, and, and none of the other researchers were either. So, so we're not ever studying anything that's human derived or the, stu the, hum the students themselves. So, so, but IRB could be an issue in other research projects if that was something you wanted to study. Then yeah. the other thing is we teach our labs all one on 10, which seems to be about the limit that we can do. So how do you have 16 with one faculty and get good experiences for the students? Um, I have a TA also. So there's two of us there so like at all money. times. One of my graduate students, yeah. I think my time is all up. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please. Delighted to introduce our next speaker, uh, Thea Muth from CUNY, uh, Brooklyn. A science for all, one microbe, one microbiome at a time. Student-driven characterization of the urban microbiome. All right. Uh, thank you all for uh, coming out this afternoon, and thank you, Graham, for organizing this session and inviting me to come and talk to you about uh, the work that we've been doing um, to train the next generation uh, scientists. Um, I don't actually have to spend uh, any time on my first slide because Lee pretty much hit all the points uh, that I have as rationale for course-based research. Um, I think the one thing that I will just emphasize again is that uh, we really can't meet all the student interest that we have in research through the apprenticeship model. So uh, typically, uh, maybe about a quarter to a third of our uh, undergraduates who are going to get the biology degree are able to actually work uh, in a faculty lab under the apprenticeship model. And in order to increase that number of students that have some exposure to research, we really need to use um, course-based research. The other thing that I'll uh, add is that course-based research um, is not new. It's been around for quite a while, and it's been shown to be uh, very effective. And, and my first experience with uh, course-based research uh, came at Haverford College, uh, where they've been running a super lab program for over 50 years now. And in the super lab, Students are in the lab uh, more than 20 hours a week. They're working on uh, research projects that are based on uh, faculty research aims. Uh, and I was lucky enough to, to be in the super lab in 1992, and it was a, a fantastic uh, experience that was really transformative. Um, at the time, I didn't call it course-based research. I just called it awesome. Uh, and if you can believe it, this fellow here that looks like uh, Eddie Munster is actually me in the uh, super lab back in 1992. So this was, I knew that this type of work was possible when, when I arrived at Brooklyn College and so I wanted to see if I could emulate that in some way. Uh, but of course um, a large university like CUNY is a very different beast than uh, a small liberal arts college so we have to think about some slightly different strategies uh, and the question that we faced was how do we make this transition from uh, the apprenticeship model to course-based research. Uh, what we decided to do was to take advantage of uh, all the advances in next generation sequencing, advances in metagenomics techniques and 16S uh, sequencing, and to focus on uh, urban microbiomes and have this be uh, the focus of the course-based research. Now, uh, this is actually like a fantastic time to be working with microbiomes. There's a lot of excitement. Uh, I just grabbed a few headlines that have been uh, published in the last few months, uh, and there is a, a lot of excitement in the community and, and efforts to kind of coordinate uh, microbiome research. Uh, the one that I'll just kind of highlight is this um, announcement from the White House on the National Microbiome Initiative, and uh, particularly looking at point three, expanding the microbiome workforce, that's exactly what we're hoping to do with our, with our microbiome projects, is get more students trained and into um, uh, perhaps the, the microbiome workforce. Now, 
the, um, what I'm going to try to describe to you in the next few minutes uh, initiated uh, at Brooklyn College, and then I will tell you a little bit later how we've tried to expand that uh, from Brooklyn College to other campuses at, at CUNY. Um, when we started, we developed what we called the authentic research experience in microbiology, and there's a couple components of that, but the main one is the Urban Microbiome Research Project, and that's what I'm going to uh, focus on today. And we really liked uh, this project because it, it gives students an opportunity to collect and analyze samples where they live, where they work, where they study, where they commute. So it, it really gets them uh, excited and involved because they're looking at things that they're very, uh, in, from environments that they're very familiar with. Uh, and the other uh, really nice thing about doing urban microbiome research is that the urban environment uh, is a little understudied. There isn't a whole lot of information out there. Uh, and given the fact that about 50% of the world's population now lives in an urban center uh, and that uh, percentage is increasing, we think that it's really perfect to be analyzing uh, microbiomes from, from the urban environment. Um, so one thing that I'll just uh, say right off the bat is that um, unlike uh, CFAGES or <clears throat> a GEP or the, the uh, courses that Lee was just mentioning, we have a module that fits into a pre-existing course. So uh, just keep that in mind that this isn't a standalone course. Uh, and I'll just take a minute to kind of run you through uh, how we work it in. Uh, the weeks here are referring to the weeks of the module, not necessarily the weeks of the semester. So uh, try not to get confused because our uh, semester is 14 weeks long. The initial introduction of the project into uh, the course starts uh, with the instructor working with the students to develop uh, the question and to come up with the experimental approach for sampling uh, that will address the question that they're going to look at. After that, you can start to get your hands dirty with actual uh, lab work, and in the first week, they're collecting samples and extracting the DNA. Uh, they then go on to um, check the DNA for quality and check the concentration, and then they go and do PCR with primers to, to barcode their <laughs> amplicons, run that out on a gel, uh, and then finally clean that up and prepare to send it out for sequencing. Um, one thing that I'll, I'll mention here that's important is that it is actually more expensive for us to do the sequencing on our own barcoded amplicons, and it's less expensive if we just send in the DNA right after we extract it. And so what we actually do is maybe a little bit like a cooking show, but we send the DNA out for sequencing at this point, um, and then allow the students to continue with weeks three through five. We have their barcoded amplicon as a uh, backup if we need it, but in the meantime, the DNA is being sequenced, which is great because not only does it save us money, uh, it means that we're going to get the data back sooner, and that's going to give us more time at the end of the semester to go through the data analysis. So having that head start on the sequencing, which can take three to six weeks, uh, is a real advantage. Um, just a little bit about how this is structured. Uh, it's going into an existing microbiology lab course. This is a standard uh, lab course that probably everyone would recognize. We have about 10 sections each semester, and uh, each section has about 18 students. And so what we've done is across the campus, we identify, and sometimes, you know, in the winter we do indoor sites, but we identify 10 areas that we want to sample, and each lab is uh, assign that task to, a sam uh, to sample one area. And then within that section, uh, we break into six groups of three students. And each group uh, goes out and goes to the area that they were assigned and collects their sample. And this could be soil or water or a swab sample. And we like having this uh, replication because we need to deal with uh, what we call the pigeon poop effect. Uh, and this is kind of an irregular environment, and you can imagine that if you're sampling from the sidewalk and, and someone just dumped their ice cream cone or a pigeon poop there, if that's the only place you sample, it's going to really affect your results. And so we like having six groups kind of sampling around the area and then combining that so we get a better reflection of what that micro microbial community might be. So 
Here, uh, th those groups will do this uh, extraction and all the steps I just mentioned independently. And then they'll pool those six samples and we send out one sample per section for sequencing. So that gives us better data and lower costs. Now, if we could afford it, we would sequence everything, but um, still this works out quite nicely. When the data comes back, uh, those students from that one section can look at their data um, and you know, kind of do a lot of data mining, but what they also can do is compare that data to the nine other sections that we're also sampling. So they get a really nice chance to look at what they've got and look at what other students were able to collect. Um, I think I, I mentioned most of this. One other thing that I didn't mention was that we build in time to uh, repeat steps because not everything goes perfectly and, and this is you know, authentic research so things never work the first time. So we like to have an opportunity for students to go back and uh, repeat things if they don't work. I think everything else here I mentioned. Now, when the data comes back, uh, in our lab, we run the raw data through Chime, and we put together an Excel spreadsheet that has a data in a format that the students uh, instru and instructors can start to work with. And this sheet here is showing essentially what the main uh, data table looks like uh, with uh, the taxa here. In the first column, these would be all your OTUs going down for two, three, four hundred, and the columns here representing the different uh, samples uh, with the numbers indicating the relative abundance of each OTU within that sample. Now in addition to this sheet, uh, in the Excel file there's another sheet that includes uh, the representative uh, sequence read for each OTU, so if students want to go and do some individual blasting with that, they can. There's a sheet that has um, a description of alpha diversity and a calculation for alpha diversity on the sample and one for beta diversity and a principal coordinate analysis. So they get all this in one package that they can then start to analyze. Um, and of course they're overwhelmed and they're kind of like panicky and they don't know where to start and so with this overwhelming data deluge we have to start them off uh, with some relatively easy tasks, sometimes just sorting by uh, uh, abundance, grouping by phyla, and doing the uh, relative abundance of the phyla within a sample. Uh, they always love to look for uh, the bacteria that they recognize. They want to go look for human pathogens so they can kind of uh, scoot around through the data to see things that are interesting for them. Once the instructors have gotten them kind of accustomed to the format of the data and what can be done, then they can kind of go on and uh, ask more kind of involved questions. <coughs> Uh, one of the reasons uh, that we really like this project is that it allows us to address a lot of the uh, curriculum guidelines from the ASM. Uh, this is the website where you can find those guidelines. And I put together this table, which doesn't list all of the curriculum guidelines, but it lists a bunch of them. And it shows where they match up with some of the elements of the microbiome research project. And I know you can't read that back there, so I blew a couple of them up. But for example, under microbial systems, you have microorganisms are ubiquitous and live in diverse and dynamic ecosystems. And that can be addressed during the project design, uh, looking at the taxonomic diversity, or in uh, more uh, involved analysis of the data. Uh, if you look at one related to scientific thinking, which is demonstrated an ability to formulate hypotheses and to design experiments uh, based on the scientific method, Again, you can address that through the project design and through the microbiome data analysis. And I'm not going to go through all of these, obviously, but you can see that it really fits nicely into to addressing a lot of the teaching objectives that you'd like to hit. And keep in mind that this is uh, an intro micro lab, so we, we want to make sure that we're hitting all the things that students would be getting in other labs uh, at other campuses. Now, <clears throat> I'll take a minute to try to uh, explain how we've been trying to scale this project. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with the City University of New York, it's the largest urban uh, public university in the country. There are almost 250,000 students. It's a very diverse student body. Um, also, 
Uh, there, about 58% of the students receive Pell Grants, 42% uh, are first generation college students, and 30% of the students work uh, 20 hours a week or more. And so what we've tried to do is be as flexible as possible because we really want to have uh, students at these other campuses and other courses have an opportunity to participate in some research uh, uh, project before they graduate. And so I'll, I'll try to mention this as I go along, but we've really tried to work with instructors to make this fit their needs and the interests of their students. And so far we've been successful at introducing the microbiome research project at most of the four-year campuses. We have a handful of the community colleges involved and we were hoping to bring a couple more on in the next year. Uh, and we've already had a chance to actually expand a little bit uh, beyond CUNY and to bring in uh, some other campuses as well. And so <clears throat> if we can get the state scaling right, if we can make this transferable, we would really love uh, to be up there on that list with CFAGES, with GEP, with Small World Initiative. Uh, we're not there obviously yet, but that's kind of what we're, we're hoping for if we can. Uh, just kind of a broad picture of the microbiome data that we've been able to collect so far. Uh, we've been at a number of campuses, a number of independent projects, uh, involved over 32 faculty, uh, over 3,000 undergraduate students. We've sequenced uh, over 275 uh, urban microbiome samples. If you look at these graphs down here, uh, just this top one is showing the OTUs per sample. And one thing that kind of just quickly jumps out is that if you look at samples from the indoor environment or the built environment, uh, the, there, there are many fewer OTUs compared to outdoor urban environments. So this city would be like streets, sidewalks, subway platforms. And those are less than urban soils or, or urban water samples. So um, we haven't had a chance to really delve into all the data, but you can see that there's some interesting trends that we can start to look into. And we think this is like a, a fantastic resource that certainly keep students busy for quite a while. Here we have a couple examples of, uh, or a few of the examples of the course-based microbiome projects uh, that uh, have been introduced at CUNY. You can see that we have outdoor and indoor campus samples, pond water samples, soil samples. There was one group that, that wanted to test their nursing lab. And so what the postdoc in the lab, Jessica, describes this as kind of a choose your own adventure. And we provide the framework, structure, resources, and work with faculty uh, in their courses to develop a microbiome project that's of either interest to their own research or that they think will be uh, particularly compelling for their students. And so uh, again, there was a lot of tweaking things so that we can make this work uh, at various campuses. Uh, just as a quick uh, example of uh, some of the projects that students have been able to um, work on, this data here was collected by students along uh, the two and the five subway line in Brooklyn. Those are these yellow circles here. And what they did was they looked for um, genera that were highly represented in their samples uh, and also matched uh, uh, genera that were highly represented in the human microbiome samples, and they did that by comparing to uh, reports in the literature. And they listed uh, those genera down here, and what they noticed uh, was that there were a few genera that uh, contained human pathogens within those groups, uh, Haemophilus, Neisseria, and Streptococcus, uh, and they seemed to be enriched at this yellow station, Winthrop station. Um, and this is a log scale on the bottom, so it's, it's actually a pretty significant enrichment. And if you go back and look at the map, what you notice is that the SUNY Downstate Medical Center is the closest uh, to the Winthrop Station. And this you know, opens up a lot of questions about is there a transfer from the hospital to the subway station? And it just, I use it as an example to illustrate what you can do with a little data mining, the types of questions and the types of hypotheses that the students are able to generate uh, after uh, completing uh, their microbiome project. This is a, another, this was a poster that was presented by students that were in the uh, microbiome research program. And in this case, uh, what the students did was that they sampled inside their science building, but they compared their data to samples that were, com that were collected in the previous semester by another group of students. And because we've 
sampled a lot of the places multiple times, we now have this longitudinal data set that allows students to start asking questions about community dynamics and how do things change from semester to semester or possibly seasonally. And so we think that that's another uh, really interesting avenue that students could uh, take their data in. Um, in regards to assessment, this slide here is showing uh, data that's based on just the work that we were uh, doing at Brooklyn College a couple years ago. Uh, we had, at that point, some sections that were doing the microbiome research uh, and other sections that were just uh, a traditional microbiology lab. And when we compared those side by side, uh, what we found is that those students that were uh, in the uh, uh, course-based research sections had more students ending up in master's or graduate programs and more students ended, ending up in professional programs in the biomedical sciences. Uh, the other uh, nice finding that we had was that students that were in the course-based research sections had fewer Ds, Fs, and Ws. And of course, that's great for the students, and it's also uh, great for the college to, to reduce the, the Ds, Fs, and Ws. This is a preliminary data uh, that we're still working on. Um, we've begun to work with uh, David Lopato using the Classroom Undergraduate Research Experience Survey. And I actually took this uh, from a CFAGES paper and I'm actually colorblind, so I can't tell which color is which, but I think uh, Cure is gray. This is courses without, um, without course-based research. Uh, the CFAGE is, is in red, and our work with uh, urban microbiomes is, is in blue. And if you look through, most, in most of the cases, we're somewhere between courses without uh, research, and, uh, but not, not as high as CFAGES. And we think that that probably makes sense because, again, uh, CFAGES is a two-semester, very involved um, uh, course-based research uh, experience, and students are going to get a lot more out of that because they're spending so much more time working on the project as opposed to ours, which is modular and going into an existing semester or an existing course. Um, but we do think that we're having an impact. Uh, other things that might explain the difference is that this uh, CFAGES data was from students that were uh, in their first year, uh, most of the students that are participating, at least the students in the data here, are from uh, a sophomore, junior, or senior year. So that might also uh, reflect some of the reported learning gains uh, that you see here. Um, finally, I, I just uh, one last bit of assessment. Um, we did a student exit interview, and I'll just see if I can play this. What was your favorite part of our project today? My favorite part was just going out into the field and collecting the samples because it was like hands-on and like it really made me feel like like a scientist. Like going to be in this sample where you guys sampled the water fountain, right? Yes, and the thing is like we sampled the water fountain like right next to the bathroom, so I know like I drink water all the time from the water fountain, so it's like I know like. I'm gonna get bad news, so it's like I'm preparing for it. Do you think we're always gonna get sick from water fountains? Um, that's another thing. Like, people don't get sick like that. So it's like, if there is like a lot of bacteria from the water fountain, maybe it's not that bad. Okay. You know, like, it's nothing for us to get all worried about because not like there's an outbreak of something going on and then we trying to find out where is it coming from because nobody's really sick. So in a way, maybe this bacteria that we think is so bad is probably helping us. Like you never know. Right. So um, I can't actually tell you if this is representative or not because it's the only exit interview that we have so far. Um, <laughs> but I, I really, I was, I was really happy to see this. Uh, I thought that the student was able to convey some of the things that he learned uh, in his microbiome research experience really well. And I would certainly, you know, I think it would be fantastic if he goes on to join the ranks of next generation scientists. Uh, but even if he decides not to, I would be uh, extremely happy if we were consistently able to turn out students that were kind of thoughtful uh, and um, uh, kind of informed uh, and didn't freak out every time that there was some publication of some horrible pathogen in some microbiome sample. And so I, I think that this is uh, an ideal outcome. Uh, finally, I'll just uh, say that these are a list of some of the things that we're able to provide to uh, the campuses that are working with us and the faculty at other, uh, that are running the other courses. 
and we provide training for instructors. We go on site and train. We do some workshops. Uh, we have protocols that are adapted for the undergraduate courses. We have support for uh, sampling and experimental design. Um, we, we'll run things through Chime, and I didn't say it when I showed the data first, but we, we think that you know, running through things, uh, having students learn how to use Chime could be very useful, but it, it's a, a lot of demand on resources and time, and we think that because this is a, an undergraduate microbiology lab course, we would rather have them analyzing the data at the end of the semester. So we, we take the Chime analysis and do that on our own. Um, we provide support for networking and websites. I'll just show you a couple screen grabs from the website. And one thing that we're really excited about is this interactive uh, map where uh, students can now uh, go and click on other campuses across the city and see what they sampled and see what the results they got were. And so this is really great so that students can kind of look at their own data, but they can also begin to compare that to data that other students collected around the city. And as hopefully we expand to other campuses outside the city, they'll be able to look uh, potentially at data across the country, which would really, really be cool. So we're, we're very excited about continuing to develop this. Uh, so finally, I'll just uh, thank uh, Avram Kaplan, who's the co-PI with me on the NSF grant. Uh, he, uh, is the undergraduate dean for research at CUNY. He does a lot of the co coordination and getting the campuses involved, dealing with IRBs. Uh, he's leading the assessment, uh, and it's been a fantastic uh, help uh, as we work on this. And then a huge thanks uh, to Jessica Joyner, who pretty much does everything. She does almost all the training. She does almost all the chime analysis. Uh, you name it, she does it. She's been really fantastic. And a thanks to the Computing Center uh, at the College of Staten Island. We have chime loaded on their servers. Um, and uh, thanks to David Lopato, who's beginning to work with us uh, on the uh, assessment. And finally, if you're, if you're interested, that you think that this might be something you want to work into one of your courses, uh, send me an email. Uh, we're really excited about trying to work with other campuses, and, and, and maybe something will come of it. So thank you. I have a quick question. Um, one could imagine that the way the sampling is done is, let's just say, not necessarily sort of hypothesis driven. But in the example with the hospital, it's hypothesis generating. And you could imagine designing a study to sample, for example, on other subway lines where you know where hospitals are to specifically to test that. I just wondered if you were sort of set up to do that. Right. Well, we, that's exactly what we'd like to do. We would like to move beyond this kind of exploratory phase to have more of the questions be hypothesis driven. And now as we get this database together, all sorts of interesting questions come out of it. And so uh, we're really encouraging faculty to kind of think in that direction. That's very nice. I'll piggyback on what Graham said. I was just thinking that this is prime for collaboration with statisticians, you know, for like graduate student um, projects and in other places. So not just collaborating with uh, schools to do the collection, data collection, but then analysis at a, you know, PhD thesis. I could see that like seeking those collaborations as well. Is more um, of a comment. I don't. I don't think that we've intentionally gone out to seek for uh, that those exact types of collaboration. But you're right. Th those you know would definitely fit really well with within the project. Uh, we have been working with some people that are strictly bioinformaticists. The the person who does the mapping with us is a GIS person. So there is a lot of interdisciplinary uh, work that's going on. Yeah. Can you use the microphone, please? So do you have your protocols uh, up on the web? They're on the website, yeah. OK. Because I, I just came from a really good um, workshop on using 16S sequencing for active learning. And I just would like to see how yours compares with So, so we use the mobile power soil kit. So our protocol uh, is essentially their protocol, but adapted for kind of scaling up. And a lot of our samples come from swabs. So we're actually using the soil kit to isolate from swabs. So there's a few things on the front end that are a little bit different. Uh, but most of it's kind of about how do you do it, you know, for a class of uh, 18 students. And so that, that protocol's uh, online. But if you have, like, specific questions, if you just email us, we can... And then um, you have about you generate about ten samples, pooled samples uh, per semester. So I was just curious what your cost per sample was. It's about uh, seventy dollars per sample for the sequence, and, and we're getting about twenty thousand uh, 16s reads per sample, which isn't a whole 
lot, but for the analysis purposes, it's like way more than we can really deal with. Um, we, we'd love to be doing you know, whole genome sequencing, but again, because of costs and because of uh, computational limitations, it, it just doesn't make sense for us to try that uh, at this point. And then finally, is this a required course? Is this a, you know, the micro course is required for uh, biology majors at Brooklyn College, and so every biology major is getting this. At other campuses, it's in their micro course, it's in a nursing course, it's in an intro bio course, uh, so there, there's some ranges. Some of those courses may not be required for the majors. Thanks. Right, thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Jeffrey Newman from Lycoming, who's going to tell us about a framework for publishing novel bacterial species discovered in the undergraduate microbiology lab. Okay, great. Well, I'd like to start by uh, thanking Graham for the invitation and the opportunity to come and talk to you all today about what we do in my lab. And I'd like to start by providing uh, a little bit of context. So many of you probably saw uh, this paper that was published this year in Nature Microbiology, uh, exploring sort of the, the huge diversity of life that's uh, out there on the planet. And in fact, a lot of these uh, lineages that have the little red dots are at the ends are lineages that are represented only by genome sequences and not actual cultured uh, organisms. And, uh, and Ted actually uh, touched on this particular study. So uh, another study published this year estimated that there were a trillion microbial species on the planet. So that gives you a sense of the breadth, uh, or actually the depth of uh, diversity that's found uh, on Earth. And given sort of that context, you know, in our lab, uh, what we focus on are uh, studying novel bacterial species that we discover in the microbiology course. So we study, uh, or in the microbiology course, we use environmental unknowns. So given the amount of diversity that, that's out there, it's not surprising that we find a lot of novel species. So uh, the starting point for the research in my lab is our uh, uh, general microbiology course, which includes a course-based undergraduate research experience. So essentially, uh, every microbiology course in the country uh, has students identify unknown organisms. So um, I get our organisms from a local creek, and one way that we identify those is by 16S ribosomal RNA sequencing. And again, we often find uh, a number of novel species. And when we do find some of these novel species candidates, sort of the, the follow-up that we do in the research methods course that I'll talk about is to compare the phenotypes of the, the new isolates with their closest relatives in order to identify similarities and differences. And then go into the literature, look and see, you know, how have other people studied uh, organisms in this particular family. For many families, there are actually publications for minimal standards. What do you need to do to publish a new species of bacteria in this family? So, um, and we'll talk uh, after that about some sort of best practices that we're sort of uh, trying to develop. In the past, the, the standard was 70% DNA, DNA hybridization. That's sort of a pain. People sort of have shifted to multi-locus sequence typing for a while. And now most uh, people in the field are, are sequencing whole genomes. And so when you have whole genomes, you can then compare the, the whole genome sequences for average nucleotide identity, average amino acid identity. Um, and then with the genome sequence, you can also identify individual genes and then correlate those with the phenotypes that you studied earlier, with the ultimate goal being to publish some of these organisms. And here's sort of my crew. This is uh, last year's group. This was the most recent year's group. So uh, the microbiology course, 
um, is offered every spring. And so usually between Christmas and New Year's, I'll go out to this local creek and I go to the same site every year because there's a nice convenient spot to park and walk down there and take my little sterile tube and collect the sample of water and sediment and take it back to the lab, uh, spread it out on some Petri plates. Now we usually do our incubations just at room temperature for two or three days because the, the lab course has uh, meets on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So we want to, students to be able to get decent colonies after two days. And then I pick individual colonies and replica plate those, uh, do individual patches onto replica plates, and I'll incubate one at room temperature and one at 37 degrees. And I only choose organisms that grow at room temperature and not at 37 to give to the students to minimize the possibility that they would obtain human pathogens. So for example, I would not use number nine because that grew at 37 or number 12, etc. But I would use something like 10 or 11. And so the, the micro courses just goes through your standard uh, types of uh, experiments. Students start off with uh, streak plating. Um, now, one thing that we do during week one is we prepare frozen permanents. Even though we don't know what these organisms are at this point, uh, we want to make permanents of them in as close to their native state as possible before they've been subcultured over the course of, of 10 weeks. In case it is something interesting, we can go back to that original prep. Um, week two, students do typical gram stains, wet mount to test for motility. We do endospore stains. Week three, test for growth at different temperatures, salt, pH, um, gas pack jar to test for whether or not they need oxygen, antibiotic sensitivity. Um, now, these plates, these aren't from a class. I didn't have any good photos. This is from a high school teacher workshop that we had done. But um, we test for uh, the utilization of different carbohydrates, the standard nitrogen metabolism test, so urease, nitrate. We do phenol red carbohydrate fermentation tests. Uh, we test for exoenzyme, the presence of exoenzymes, differential selective media. And so over those five weeks, the students generate quite a bit of data. In week six, we PCR amplify 16S ribosomal RNA with uh, 27F1492R, so we get pretty good size uh, products. We send those out for sequencing, and the students also um, will take their five weeks of, of data and go through Burgies and try to figure out what their organism is, try to come up with a hypothesis. And they actually have to turn this hypothesis in before we do some of the more database uh, type methods. So in uh, week seven, while we're still waiting to get our DNA sequence data back, we do a fatty acid methyl ester analysis. We had a grant in 2009, a major research instrumentation grant from the NSF for a gas chromatograph and a biolog instrument. So the, the fatty acid instrument um, will compare the, the fatty acid profile to a database and it gives a tentative uh, identification. So again, the students have to turn in their their hypothesis uh, before they get that result back. And then the biolog as well provides a tentative identification. Now the biolog plate is a, a the Gen 3 plates are a 96 well plate that have nine columns of different carbohydrate sources, um, or I should say carbon sources rather, and three columns of potentially inhibitory conditions. And the idea is you compare the growth with the different carbon sources to the negative control, you compare the growth with the different uh, potentially inhibitory conditions to the positive control, and so then you can go through a match and say, okay, well, this organism uses starch, it uses maltose, it uses trehalose, it uses glucose, mannose, doesn't use lactose, which is right there. Uh, it's, so it uses acetic acid, it's uh, resistant to astreonam and vancomycin, but it's sensitive to naledixic acid because you see it's not growing there. It's also sensitive to lincomycin. So the students get a huge amount of data just from uh, using the Biolog Gen 3 plates. So then in week eight, we get our DNA sequence data back, and uh, we usually use Easy Taxon for our DNA sequence analysis because it compares, uh, there's so much data just in GenBank, it's uh, Easy Taxon's nice because it's curated, it has all the, the type strain sequences. And then uh, the students will align their DNA sequence along with uh, a set that I give them uh, in order to construct a phylogenetic tree to see which 
group of organisms. In this case, this particular student's clustered with E. coli, so th this was actually before I started screening to remove the 37 degree growers. But um, uh, in this case, uh, this organism's clustering with the, the, the Enterobacteriaceae. So easy taxon, uh, one of the other nice things about this is it gives um, a, a more detailed pairwise similarity score as opposed to, for example, just doing a blast search on NCBI where you get like 99%, 98%, and it's nice to have a little bit more detail than that. And so here's an example of the easy taxon results. You can see the pairwise similarity scores here. And so then when the students get these results back, one question is, okay, well, if this is the best match, this flavobacterium resistens, does that mean that's what my organism is? Uh, and really, the, there's a lot of critical thinking that goes into this with the students where the fatty acids might give them one answer, the biolog gives them another answer, and the 16S gives them another answer. Well, which one's right? And, and so they have to sort of think about it and work through and uh, look at the strengths and, and weaknesses of each of the different uh, methods. Now, in the case of the, the 16S sequence, uh, uh, study was published in 2006 correlating uh, 16S ribosomal RNA sequence similarity with DNA-DNA hybridization. And uh, the, the official threshold for what's a, a novel species is 70% DNA-DNA hybridization value. So if you look uh, at this green line, which are 70% DNA-DNA hybridization, you'll see that any organisms that have below uh, the blue line here, which is about 98.5%, anything below that blue line is essentially guaranteed of being to the left or less than 70% DNA-DNA hybridization. So if you have a 16S sequence that's less than 98.5, you're essentially guaranteed it's going to be less than 70% DNA-DNA hybridization and it'll be a novel species. So that's sort of the uh, official definition. Uh, more refined studies come out since then that's estimated at more at 98.7. Now, in order to publish a, a novel species, uh, one has to compare the phenotypes to the closest relatives, and you also have to deposit your organism into two culture collections in, in different countries, and also deposit your DNA sequences in GenBank. So at that point, for the microbiology course, the students sort of end with, okay, this is what I think I have, and, and they write up their lab report, they, they read the literature. But then many students will choose to follow up, especially if they have a novel organism, um, and take the, the upper level research methods course, which is similar to um, uh, the course that, that Lee was talking about, where the students are, it's an upper level course, and, and they're conducting research. And so in the micro course, we do a single um, Sanger read in order to identify the organism. But in research methods, if a student's following up on it, we do four more reads in order to get the entire gene covered on both strands uh, so that it can be deposited in GenBank. And then we reconstruct a phylogenetic tree to make sure that um, with the, the full sequence that it still looks like it's a novel organism. We redo the search with, against easy taxon. So we identify the organisms that we think are going to be, uh, or at least that are clustering most closely with our organism. Uh, and then we'll get those from culture collections. And I'll say uh, we don't get them from ATCC, which is way too expensive. The, the DSMZ, German culture collection, is much cheaper. Um, and then there are a number of places that if you deposit an organism with them, they will give you one for free. So we also often will, will do that as well to get free uh, type strains from them. Uh, let's see, so we get the culture, uh, we get the type strains, and then we repeat everything we did in the microbiology in parallel with the, the reference strains and the, uh, the potentially novel organism with the goal of ultimately preparing a, um, a poster, presenting at ASM, I have a number of students here every year, and, and then finally hopefully getting a paper published in the International Journal of Systematic and Evolutionary Microbiology. Well, I sort of skipped over the genomes. So the other thing that we also want to do is sequence the genomes for these organisms. So just uh, before I get to the genome analysis, with the um, uh, phenotypic comparison, so this is our, our novel organism. These are the two reference strains, and, and there's some clear differences in the percentages of the different fatty acids in these organisms. 
Uh, for the Biolog Gen 3 plates, again, we'll run those in parallel to identify similarities and differences. So, for example, let's see, I'm trying to find a good one off the top of my head here. Um, well, actually, here, over here is a few good ones. So, the novel organism is able to use formic acid, whereas the other two don't. Uh, the reference strains both use uh, acetic acid, but uh, our novel one doesn't. Uh, our novel organism is sensitive, it's inhibited by as trionam, whereas the other two are not. Um, these other two organisms use acetoacetate, whereas our novel one doesn't. So we can go through and identify uh, similarities and differences with the Biolog Gen 3 plates. We will uh, often, especially if they're pigmented, extract the pigments, separate those by HPLC. And I'll, I'll show you another one later where we can uh, see the, the different types of pigments. This is a carotenoid, which you can tell by sort of the shoulder peak peak. Um, but we can separate out the different pigments uh, in order to identify those. So, so that's a lot of the, the phenotypic testing. But in order to publish a strain, one thing you need to do is to demonstrate genomic uniqueness um, it, uh, in some way. And historically, it's been done via DNA-DNA hybridization and then multi-locus sequence typing and finally genomes. So many of you have probably seen this graph before showing the decreasing cost of whole genome sequencing over time. And we got involved with this. Uh, well, originally, um, I uh, met Malcolm Campbell back in 2000 uh, from Davidson College and was involved in the Genome Consortium for Active Teaching. At that time, we were using uh, microarrays. Uh, uh, Malcolm was able to provide access to microarrays. We incorporated this into a number of courses. And then uh, as next generation sequencing uh, began to become less expensive, uh, a sort of a, a group of us sort of split off and formed a new group, GCAT Sequence, to bring next generation sequencing um, to the undergraduate curriculum. We were part of the initial uh, pilot study and were able to get three of our organisms' uh, genomes sequenced. And since then, Juniata has really been the leader in GCAT Seq. Actually, just a week or last week, they had a, a workshop at Juniata, and they've had funding from HHMI and, and NSF for a lot of these projects. And so through GCAT Seq, one thing that we do is organize shared runs because a, a single next gen run generates so much data, most faculty uh, at undergrad institutions aren't going to be able to use or, or afford that much data. So, uh, so these are a couple of the next gen runs that I've organized. This particular one had DNA samples from like 16 uh, different institutions. And uh, this is uh, a MySeq run for de novo uh, assembly. We like the longer uh, 300 base reads. And so the cost uh, per sample, uh, the most recent one we did that's not on this particular slide was down about $150 a sample. And here's an example of the assembly. We use NextGene, it's Windows-based. You don't have to have Linux programming or Perl or any of that stuff. So um, this is one of our, uh, of course, I'm showing you one of the better assemblies, uh, where we had 2 million reads and ultimately got that down to 13 contigs initially. But then through some manual genome editing for that particular one, that's Flavo Aquatile, we got that one down to, to 7 contigs. But so these are a number of the genomes that we've sequenced, deposited in GenBank. Many of these are some of our novel species, but most of them are actually some of the reference strains that have not had their, had not had their genome sequenced before. And now there are projects such as the Genomic Encyclopedia for Bacteria and Archaea that are sequencing all the type strains, which will make this a lot easier and cheaper, since they'll already be in GenBank. So with the, the whole genome sequences, uh, what we're able to do with those is to um, do whole genome comparisons in order to determine average nucleotide identity. So this particular graph shows relationships between DNA-DNA hybridization, average nucleotide identity, and the cutoff, the threshold's about 95%. Um, uh, again, here's uh, another graph showing that around 95% average nucleotide identity, that correlates with 70% DNA-DNA hybridization. Um, this one sort of uh, is correlating average nucleotide identity to 16S sequence, and again, we're in that 95, 96% average nucleotide identity range. 
And in order to do our uh, analysis, we use, again, we're not hardcore bioinformaticians. So we just use simple web-based tools where you upload your FASTA files. Uh, this one's from Costas Costa Tinnitus Lab at Georgia Tech. You upload your, uh, your files and click the button and you get your average nucleotide identity. Um, Easy Taxon has uh, a portion called Easy Genome that also has an average nucleotide identity calculator. Um, the German Culture Collection has a tool called this Genome Genome Distance Calculator that will estimate DNA DNA hybridization values based on um, uh, whole genome sequences. And so here's an example of some of the results uh, that we have now. These are two isolates from students in the class, uh, Jake, Jacob R. Miller and Katie M. Stankiewicz. We always use strain designations based on the students' names because they're their organisms. Um, but their organisms actually are above the threat, the 95% threshold and 70% threshold. So those are actually going to be the same uh, species, different strains of the same species. But the closest relatives are below the threshold, below 95%. Uh, or below 70%. So that's a novel species. Um, in order to do our, our genome annotation, we use uh, uh, RAST. So again, you can just upload the FASTA file. And that, this uh, will take the FASTA. It'll also give you the GC composition. So it's just another web-based tool. And uh, once the, the genome is an annotated, uh, or all the genes are identified, you get a list of these different categories and you can click on the little uh, plus signs there in order to expand them into different subsystems or pathways within a particular pathway. Uh, and then what we're able to do is then correlate these different subsystems, these different pathways with the phenotypes. So for example, uh, here we see trehalose uptake and utilization is found in this uh, particular organism, but not this other one. And that correlates with uh, the phenotypic difference we observe with the biolog. Okay, uh, RAST also has a sequence-based comparison tool where you can take multiple genomes and compare them to each other. So here's an example of the output of that where each organism is uh, essentially a separate cluster of, of columns there. And you can take that table and look at it in more detail. So if you mouse over individual genes, like here we found this is a, uh, an operon involved in carotenoid biosynthesis. So if you mouse over this, we've got lycopene cyclase. And this operon is found in uh, this organism, Chrysobacterium hispalense, but it's missing in several of these other organisms, including one that's going to be a novel, uh, that's, going to, that's a novel species that we're going to be publishing here soon. So this organism is missing the carotenoid biosynthetic operon. And then that can be correlated with the, the pigment profile. So uh, here we could see the characteristic carotenoid profile of shoulder peak peak in the absorbent spectra for that particular um, compound that's missing in populense that's missing the, the carotenoid biosynthetic genes. Um, RAST also will color code these individual uh, genes based on the similarity, uh, average amino acid similarity. So here you can see a, a cluster where we have a high level of similarity. As it turns out, uh, one of the genes in this particular area near the end is a uh, recombinase, is probably a transposon. And then, well, actually, if you click the little export table button here, you can get a tab separated value file you bring into Excel. And these genes that are present in both organisms, you get an amino acid sequence similarity, uh, in this case, 86%. But this is after uh, sorting the, the data. So you can see here's a set of genes that are found in the reference organism but aren't in the other ones. Here's a set of genes that were present in the reference and this organism but not this middle one. Um, so based on the, the amino acid sequence similarity, you can take all these genes that are shared between two organisms and take an average of that to determine average amino acid identity. And average amino acid identity is another metric that is uh, useful to distinguish between organisms. 
and you can then create matrices of these. And, and in particular, average amino acid identity is valuable at a, at a broader scale, for example, to distinguish different genera. And so here, this particular matrix is showing um, these different genera that have an average amino acid identity between about 50 and 70 uh, percent. And so this way, you can identify if your organism is actually a new genus and potentially get to name that. Um, now, we mentioned these different groups of genes that have, are in the reference and one or, or another of the other organisms. So a student, former student in my lab developed a tool that's able to take the output from RAST and it will identify, uh, it'll count up the number of genes in each category. Is this in gene, organism one and two, one, two, and three? Is it in all five of these different organisms? And so th this is available on the website that I'll show you in a second, but uh, this will create the list of gene numbers that are in these different categories. And we developed a little template that you can then put this together to create a Venn diagram to identify core genes or identify the unique genes or the number of genes in individual groups. So all these tools are available on my website. Easiest way to get to it so you don't have to like remember it is novelmicrobe.com. You go there, it'll take you to my website. And so we've got lots of tools there. And I will say this website was developed by my 16-year-old son. He's brought it into the 21st century. He's done a good job. Um, so we've been able to publish a few novel species. We probably have 100 in the freezer. We have a long way to go uh, to get some of these out. That's the challenging part is getting the papers out, but we have gotten a few of them out. And one way we're hoping to get all these out is by, if you remember Mad Libs from when you were a kid, right, where you just fill, put in an adjective, put in a noun. We're trying to do like a micro libs for some of these novel species papers where the students can basically kind of fill in the banks, blanks so we can kind of get some of these, paper, these organisms published. So finally, this is my gang from New Orleans last year. We had a good time. Uh, a lot of the Venn diagram tools were developed by Tom and Andrew right there. And again, this is my current group. So I thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Hello there. Um, I currently teach uh, microbiology at a community college. Four-fifths of my sections are pre-nursing, as is typical at most community colleges. But I've recently been tasked with reworking the curriculum for the majors microbiology course. Uh, we're actually facing transferability issues because the curriculum has become too biotech. That is to say, it is not fulfilling the traditional, uh, my, it, it's strayed from the purview of what is considered microbiology. I was really excited to see the beginning of your presentation because it followed a very traditional uh, microbiology approach while bringing modern techniques in and so I kind of have an eye to doing something like this as incorporated into the second half of a survey course in general microbiology um, and wanted to know first off if your slideshow is available and uh, second uh, if you can recommend any resources uh, well, it's, it's not available yet, but it will be soon once I get it up on the website, since I just finished it probably a couple hours ago. But uh, <laughs> anyway, um, now the resource Easy Taxon is a great website. I mean, all my protocols, all my course protocols are up on my website, so you can use those if you have questions. You know, you could email me. Uh, but yeah, all, all our protocols that we have are now up on, my, on the website. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. Can, can, I, can I just ask you, I think you gave a, um, I think I heard you say that the Sequencing costs would, should be around $150. A That's for whole genomes. For whole genomes. Whole, the whole genome is about 150 now. But there's a whole lot of other stuff going on, right? And I just wondered if you had a sense of what the overall, a sense well, of overall cost with the other analyses. Yeah. Included. In the microbiology course itself, the PCR and sequencing for a single Sanger read, we've had it for $2.50 through Beckman Coulter, but now they were bought by GeneWiz, now it's gonna be more expensive. So, But that between the PCR and sequencing, that's probably about maybe $5 a sample. The Biolog Gen 3 plates are $10 if you include the blood auger, the inoculating fluid, the plate. Okay, so that was my other question. Yeah, the Biologs are about $10 a piece. $10? Yes. 
just one last quick one. But we only do the genome sequencing for the novel ones. So obviously, the students don't sequence their, all their, but in a few years, I bet, one of the first things they're going to do is sequence their genomes. I just had a quick biolog question. Um, I actually use that machine as well, and I saw that you compared the three strains. Did you just set that up, that little sort of heat map thing, manually, or was there some way you could do that yeah, where you compare? Just export just the data into Excel and then use Excel's um, conditional formatting tool. Thanks. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Christine White Ziegler from Smith, who's going to tell us about RNA Seq for undergraduates, uh, a student directed experimental course for whole transcriptome studies in bacteria. Hi, it's nice to be here, and thank you, Graham, for inviting me to give this talk. I guess I better get on my. Uh, my talk here. All right, so as we're waiting for this um, to come up, um, I'm really going to tell you about a, a 300 level course. So again, uh, we're hearing a recurring theme here for undergraduates um, using RNA-seq. So I hope I can convince you that RNA-seq is um, a potential thing that undergraduates um, can do. And I also, for people who maybe are at other larger institutions, the, I wanted to emphasize here, and I'll talk about this a little bit more, it was really successful because I partnered with our core facility um, in terms of doing uh, the uh, teaching of this course. All right, so this is biochemical research for advanced uh, techniques, using advanced techniques. So we've heard a lot of these things before. We wanted to increase student access, and we also have a, a large pressure uh, on our individual faculty labs for student research. But we also had a, other goals, and that was to introduce students to more advanced research instrumentation, which I'm going to talk about, and also the hope and the goal that by having students come in and use these techniques within um, the course that they would actually take it back to some of the research labs at Smith and, and broaden the use of these techniques. All right, so in this course, we were trying to do from start to finish in the semester, um, trying to cover three different areas by in this transcriptomic experiment, going, doing both starting with that microbiology and the molecular biology, moving into biostatistics to look at um, our data set, and then looking into bioinformatics to really understand then what did that gene list mean and how did that uh, represent bacterial physiology. All right, so I said I wanted to talk about this briefly, the fact that I partnered in this class um, with Luann Beerwort. You'll hear me call her Louie because that's uh, how she goes by. She's our instrumentation and techniques instructor. So Smith is a small liberal arts college, but we decided we made a purposeful choice um, to create centers at Smith. We have several of these centers in the sciences. And so at, in these centers, it's really basically a research lab that's devoted specifically to all of our instrumentation. And then with each of these centers, uh, we have a, a half-time to a full-time person who works um, in them. And we call them the instrumentation and techniques instructors. I worked with uh, Louie, who's the, the ITI for our Center for Molecular Biology. So there are things that you would be used to thinking of core facilities at larger um, institutions as doing equipment maintenance, one-on-one -on -one training, and certain services. And, so that's part of what our centers do. We do um, in, uh, in house, we do do capillary sequencing, and we also got a MySeq through our HHMI grant. Um, but also, the center ITIs are meant to go further than this, and so they will come into our classrooms and teach about things like sequencing, like our mass spec like the MySeq, they will give those types of talks. We do some K, K through 12 outreach through the center, um, and also research mentoring is becoming more an aspect of what these center ITIs do. So Louie and I embarked upon this course. How we structured it was that we had um, 
to the 1030 to 11, uh, 1030 to 12 hour time period on Tuesday, Thursday. Then we took the lab, the four hour lab on Tuesday afternoon. And I focused on that because that basically allowed us to have those students on Tuesday from 1030 to five. We didn't, we usually let them have lunch, but we had the option to get something done during lunch if we wanted to. I also want to focus here, it says lecture discussion, but this was almost all discussion. It was primary literature, reading, it was experimental design. We met in a seminar room, not in a classroom during this time period. You'll also notice it, all, it had intro bio, intro chem, and, and an intermediate genetics course that were prereqs for this, but not microbiology. And in fact, I think most of the students in the course didn't have micro. Um, so this was also gonna be an interesting challenge for them to learn a lot of microbiology through the course. All right, we, uh, Louie and I went together, I think to the initial GCAT uh, seek workshop. And so that was really great for getting us on board with tools, on board with strategies, um, and the other thing was thinking about the course and the course development. So we don't need to go through all this because we're going to come to it. I just wanted to point out that in the workshop they had us think about the vision and change core competencies. And so we were able to address all of those core competencies within the course. Um, and then I, the only reason I focused here was these underlines are um, what we used for evaluation. So the lab notebook was a big component, poster at a campus research symposium, and then following up with a draft manuscript that was written on their project. Um, so all of this coupled with their participation in the course were how we evaluated it. All right, so here's the layout a little bit. We're gonna keep getting a little bit more deeper as I go through. During the first half of the course was the experimental design. It was growing bacteria under our, our test conditions, whatever they chose, and I'm gonna talk about that. And then isolating the RNA. Um, at that point, the students went into doing the ribosomal RNA depletion, reverse transcription to create their library. Um, and then at that point, they were doing the sequencing. So again, because this, we had a MySeq on campus, um, the students were actually able, they were in required to help put the samples together, get them ready, and, then, and they were literally able to work with Louie to put it on the MySeq. And then at that point, they had base space accounts. They were actually able to look at the data that came out as, as the MySeq was doing its work. After that, and we'll talk a little bit more, we went into the biostatistics. How do we normalize these data sets? How do we find statistically significant genes? And then we moved into the bioinformatics um, part of it. What type of genes did we see? Were, were they enriched? Were differentially expressed transcripts enriched in pathways um, from transcription factors and so forth? So how to get the students going on this to initiate their projects. Um, so this did build a, a bit from my own research work. Um, so we were going to, we started with introducing microbes that they could use to approach their questions. We did limit that. Um, we read journal articles to familiarize the students with the microbes they could work with and with the RNA-seq um, techniques so that they understood this. And then we had class members propose experimental questions um, that they would like to do and pitch those to the class. So, so to sort of lay the foundation for how they could design their own project, um, I, we, I actually had them read a microarray paper that my, a couple that my laboratory had done previously. And what we were thinking about was how do environmental cues, uh, how do, uh, microbes respond to different cues in their environment. And so uh, the work that I had done in my lab was on temperature, but you know they could see from this that there are a number of different environmental cues and that these can impact gene expression and how, and think about the ideas about how this might um, uh, impact their physiology and their adaptation. 
We gave them a choice of three different strains of E. coli that they could work with, a commensal strain, a uropathogenic strain, and an enteropathogenic uh, strain. And these, again, are, are strains that I work with in my research. Um, I think relating to someone's uh, question before, we have an institutional biosafety committee that had um, okayed work with this, and so I had a protocol. So that was one of the first things these students learned in my lab was going through the protocol on how to work with these microbes. We had a hard time trying to figure out how we were going to do this, meaning we, we wanted each student pair to do a, a comparison between a test versus a control um, condition that they wanted to look at. Uh, and we thought about the option of number one, doing novel pilot studies, let each group do whatever they wanted, but we realized with having that type of strategy, then we would not have biological replicates and we wouldn't have a way to test, really test statistical significance. Uh, we thought about the idea of extending the study directly from my research, uh, which would have given a really good solid background data, but then the students wouldn't have the ownership of picking their own topic. And so the third idea was how do we try to convince them that if we could minimize the number of questions in the class that we could come up with, we'd both be able to have biological replicates and statistical significance. Um, we sort of got to number three. <laughs> we were hoping to have it be a student, um, uh, student designed idea and their, their choice to do that. And we did actually get down to three groups. And they chose, and so I named them, or well, they actually named themselves. We had Team Phage. <laughs> and they wanted to see how do bacteria respond to viral infection. And I'm sure this came out of the fact that several of these students had done the C phages earlier in their um, undergraduate career. We had Team Stressed, who wanted to look at the response of bacteria to sublethal doses of antibiotics. And this group who wanted to look at how bacteria respond to golden seal, which is known to be it's a natural product for the treatment of UTIs. This part went amazingly well to me. These students were all from the students spending maybe a week of their free time looking in the literature that they came up with these ideas. Uh, but that meant that we had to tell them, OK, that's a great idea, but go back. Now, you have to actually define what you're going to do. So this group, Team Phage, um, you know, we started talking about time points, and so they looked into the literature, looked at viral um, life cycles, and said, we want to see how the bacteria respond immediately five minutes post-infection. Um, and then this group, you know, we went into what antibiotics do they have on hand, what was the MYC, and what were they going to use at as a tenfold less dose is what they chose based on the literature. And this group um, wanted to look at berberine, which was the active ingredient in golden seal. Um, this part of the course would have liked a little bit more time, and if we could have had some um, pilot experiments done um, with that, that probably would have strengthened this part of the class just to know um, that they could actually see the effect um, in the time periods that they were looking for. All right, so here's us in the lab. So it turns out, you know, it was great for these students in terms of learning a lot of wet lab and molecular biology and microbiological um, experimentation. Whether many of these students hadn't worked with microbes um, extensively, so they learned all about sterile technique. We did, we did do some pilot experiments and just growing and isolating um, those cells. Um, they got to work in the hood. They got to do the RNA isolation on their own. So, I, um, so a lot of molecular techniques here. This is another student who was doing the ribosomal RNA depletion with um, magnetic beads. So there was a diversity of those types of things they got to do. And then here, uh, moving over into the Center for Molecular Biology. Uh, we had students were able to use the nanospec and our qubit in order to learn how to do um, DNA and our RNA quantification. Uh, we have uh, Agilent bioanalyzers, so when they got to the point of library construction, 
they were able to look at quality here. And this is Louis showing students, showing them a flow cell. And here's our MySeq um, and able to look at, here's some of our uh, base space uh, type of uh, information that came out about the run. One thing that was a little bit of an unexpected benefit was introducing some of these students to a larger scientific community. Uh, what I didn't, uh, so this is our Center for Molecular Biology, and you can see, so we have clustered all of our instrumentation here. And whether it's a class or where it, whether it's during the summer now, students are coming in to use different instrumentation. It's a way in which you get some community uh, created. Uh, there, what I haven't mentioned so far is there were certainly glitches. Some, uh, one of the groups did, had a very hard time with the RNA isolation and they came in on their own time to try it again. And that meant sometimes they were there in the uh, evenings or on the weekends. And so they very quickly learned about the graduate students and technicians who were, in the, who were on the floor and who were extremely helpful in helping with them. So that was, that ended up being really great. All right, so at about mid-semester, we were able to get data sets from our MySeq. We did two different runs on the MySeq and, and had um, actually, uh, the quality of the data was, was great. Not every group had three sets of biological replicates, but they had at least two. Um, so at that point, we had the raw reads and had to go into the biostatistics portion of that. Um, I am a big fan of Rock Hopper. Um, this uh, software is specifically meant to do RNA-seq for bacterial transcriptomes. Um, so it's a very approachable software. Um, for undergraduates, for people like me, it's very approachable. And so in this, it pops out from you. It will take in your FASTA raw reads, and what it will give you back is an Excel table that will give you both raw reads and normalized data. It will give you p-values and q-values. So it was really great to have all that data that we could actually talk about those ideas and st biostatistics that were important. Um, and I say we because we were, we will do more of this. We got someone in math to actually come and talk about <laughs> the biostatistics that go into large data sets and how Q values are determined. And the students really commented very positively about having um, the expert come in. The other thing I really like about um, Rock Hopper is that the way it's sort of, it's basically cover, uh, coordinated with IGB, so you can take your transcriptic, transcriptomic data into IGB, and they will get a really nice readout here. And so here's a few of our samples here, and you can look at the runs, and you can see how reproducible biological replicates are between each other. And then the green, uh, the ups and downs you see here um, are pointing out uh, differentially expressed genes. So you can sort of scan and look for that. Um, there's also operon prediction in this uh, software as well. But, right, at that point, they, had, they all had groups of differentially expressed genes. Um, and so what did that actually mean? Uh, mean was sort of the next part of what we did in the course. So we've ta we took a number of different uh, online sources uh, for information and created a database there and utilized these individually as well. So from E. coli genome project, I think this is pretty much archived. Um, data, but they have some really good lists of gene lists with uh, gene names, locus tags, functions, which we also combined with data that we got from EcoPsych. And so put those together into a data database. We could bring in from Rock Hopper, we could bring in the, the uh, G differential expression ratios that we had. We also use virulence factors uh, of pathogenic bacteria because this was able to tell us about, I don't think I really focused on the fact that most of our, all of our students chose to use the urinary tract 
pathogens, so we needed to bring in information about virulence factors here, GO numbers, and Regulon DB, which gave us information on different tra transcriptional factors. So EcoPsych turned out to be an extremely valuable research source for us because if you haven't used EcoPsych, EcoPsych has really nice curation. Um, here, so for these students who didn't know a lot of microbiology, didn't know bacterial physiology, uh, if a gene came up as being differentially expressed, they could go here and at least start to get a brief introduction to what that gene encoded and what the protein did. It also has a number of different uh, other pieces of information um, like operon structure, uh, regulators that control the operon are all there at EcoPsych. Um, EcoPsych also has an, a set of pathway tools, and I actually went out to, uh, out to Stanford to SRI, who runs uh, EcoPsych, and took one of their tutorials there. And so they have different tools within EcoPsych in which uh, what you're seeing here is a cellular overview, so students could take their transcriptomic data and paint it over the metabolic diagrams, and so you can sort of hear, see here, right, our glycolysis and respiration pathway, there tended to be more genes that were uh, differentially expressed in those pathways. So they, you can both visualize this data, but you can also do enrichments. You can do go enrichments on the site as well. Uh, they also have the same type of thing for transcription factors, in which you can look at a transcription factor, in this case, this is actually a sigma factor, and then you can see it's RPOS, and you can see, you can look at and see all the genes that are controlled by that transcription factor. So you have sort of top level transcription factors and subsequent uh, direct and indirect uh, genes that are regulated by it. So the students were introduced to all these tools. We probably spent two to three weeks uh, where we sat then in a computer lab with us there and available where they could put together their stories. And here's an example just of one of the posters um, that came out, out where they were looking at subinhibitory concentration of antibiotics and what happened um, with exposure to that. And so they were able to put together things in which they could see, you know, things like uh, PPGPP being uh, impacted in this. You know, this is sort of more an overall overview nucleotide synthesis, amino acid degradation that came out with a nice, a nice model to do that. So they presented those posters um, in a scientific poster session there on campus, and then they, we culminated at the end of the semester um, in doing a draft manuscript. And so the, the poster was a group effort, but then our, each student did their own man, uh, manuscript from, uh, from the data. All right, so how, I'll start with how students suggested we improve the course, because it was, it was a, we ended up with 11 students in this course. We need to do more uh, assessment here, but this was our first time through, and these were the types of things that they said. They said we had, that the number of goals of the course was really quite ambitious. I would probably agree with that, but I was actually really proud at how well they had done in, in doing all of those. Uh, they felt like they wanted a little bit more time for the analysis and to put together their posters and suggested maybe that this would be better as a year-long uh, uh, course. They suggested considering narrowing the number of questions to ask. So that was sort of nice because <laughs> they told us that that's what we should do next time, which was sort of our gut instinct, and so now, now they've mandated it. Um, and increasing the guest lectures, which I would do. We mentioned that we had a, status, a biostatistician come in. We also had someone come in uh, from computer science, and I think we would like to uh, increase that exposure in the course. Um, but what they liked, they really commented uh, on liking learning the research process. I really liked this. I really enjoyed working on such a complicated pr project. That's really nice to hear from from a student, they enjoyed learning a lot of new techniques. Many of these students hadn't seen these um, in, in any other course. They mentioned again the guest lectures 
And then also, uh, we had several students who mentioned to us that they had just gone on job interviews, whether for full-time jobs or uh, for summer research internships. So this ended up um, being a great thing to talk about in their interview to, to do that. So they felt like uh, they had really had a valuable experience in terms of that aspect of their career. Um, so this is a course we'll be teaching again next spring. Um, and so we hope to take some of the comments that we've had and improve it in ways that uh, the students suggested. And, but I would have to say we really enjoyed teaching uh, the class. Um, and that is, I think, half of it, right? You have just such enthusiasm. When you love the class, it really comes across to the students. So with that said, I just need to thank all the different people who were involved. Um, uh, Louie, who co-taught the course with me, and the other, st uh, the other uh, staff and graduate students who helped serendipitously in the course, guest lecturers. I had two students in my lab who had actually done and piloted and gone through a whole RNA-seq, so they were very helpful uh, to us knowing we could do this, and our curricular resources, funding, as always, and the first members of the class. Thank you. Dr. Ziegler, thank you so much for that talk. <laughs> I was wondering whether um, you had considered one way of narrowing down the question as presenting the manuscripts or the posters that the students this past se semester completed and then having them, instead of doing a pitch, either defend the um, strengths or highlight the weaknesses of a given experimental design as one might in a peer review or in terms of like taking a pilot project to the next level and yeah. then proceeding from there. Yeah, I think that would be an excellent idea. And you know, I think I think we're I think we're set to do that between having sort of being able to say these students did it and give them the success that the students had before, but saying we really need to 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 narrow it, right, to make it more more statistically significant and more related to what was going on. Yeah. Hi, uh, really wonderful talk. Uh, I, I like you. the example of being able to do something really complex uh, with undergraduates. Um, you have a lot of support, right, uh, there, and having a technician yep. and those types of things really are critical. I'm curious um, as to the cost of the RNA-seq. I mean, I, I know the ribozero reactions themselves are, you know, expensive. Um, how, how many... Uh, samples were you putting on a MySeq run, you know, those types of things? You oh, two yeah. Lines. So. Oh, I'm sorry. So uh, yeah. in terms of the number of samples on the MySeq run, we've, uh, we run six per, my, per flow cell. That usually gives us about 2.5 million reads per okay. transcriptome. And you're finding that that's enough to do things with? Yeah, we went from the literature. Yeah, we do. We've, we've done enough RNA-seq now to know it's, it's representative. But there's someone who's done a really nice study showing that whether you're at 2.5 to 10 million, you get... Uh, it's about the same. You get, you get about the same. Yeah. All right. Thanks. But it is, just to answer your other question, it is a costly course to run that we hope will come down, you know, over time with more people doing RNA-seq and next-gen sequencing. Right. I, I was impressed with your students' comments. Um, they, they're, they're things that I see, too, uh, when I do complex things. And it just, to see them get excited about that is just really awesome. So. Yeah. yeah. It is a wonderful talk. Uh, so if I come to the more practical side, you have three teams. So each team have three or four students? So we had, it worked out that we had two, two that had three students on them and one, one that had five. And we would not do that again. <laughs> three was good. Three was great. They worked really well together. Everyone was totally involved, but the other group was a little too large. But you think if a two is maybe too small? Uh, no, I think two would probably be two really good, be good as well. But three seemed to work really. There was a lot of good talks and connections that were made, yeah. 
So then the other practical question is, you said they could come back to the lab in the evening or over the weekend. How often do you do that? How do you sort of make sure the safety issues do you have encountered that? So we just have a, you know, we have a rule, and probably most places have this, right? They, they could not come alone. They needed to have a buddy. Um, so it turns out, and so most of the times that they were coming back might have been like, say, six, four, you know, five to, five to eight at night or sometimes on the, the weekends. And there's always people there. So it's sort of the safety also of the floor besides just in my lab, yeah. Okay, one last question. Yeah. So because RNA sick, the sample quality is so critical. Does any team encounter, say they didn't get the good RNA as they expecting or? Yeah, there was one, one team, the five person team, <laughs> that could not get the RNA isolation. Uh, really, could, they had a really hard time with that. So I did substitute and gave them some RNA Perfect. at some point, and then they were able to take the RNA and do the depletion successfully from there on. But thank you. So what it, that's a good point to have some safety nets. Thank you. All right. All right. Last but not least uh, uh, is Sarah Brownell from Arizona State who's going to tell us about faculty perspectives on course-based undergraduate research experiences. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you to everyone who's stayed through it all. Um, I'm your last chance right before dinner. Um, so today, uh, what I'd like to do, and I think it was kind of fun the way the session ended up, that you heard a bunch, a lot of little projects um, at, at single institutions. And what I'm gonna do is actually take a step back and present more of an overview of some of my research that I've done looking at national uh, uh, study of faculty who, who teach course-based undergraduate research experiences. So kind of my overview for my talk is I wanna, I wanna talk a bit about exactly what course-based undergraduate research experiences are. We've heard a lot about that today, but I wanted to specifically articulate why certain aspects of these courses represent kind of really novel pedagogical innovations uh, for faculty, and Lee already touched on, on this a little bit, and so I'm going to kind of extend what he talked about. Uh, go into faculty benefits and challenges to teaching a cure uh, based on a national study that I've conducted, and then end with talking about some tension points that are potentially emerging uh, between faculty and students in a cure. So we've heard a lot about the positives, but I wanted to kind of offer some, some caveats and some things that we should be mindful of. So cures, uh, so lots of different variety of, of cures um, as, as we've heard today, and so you already have a lot of good examples. Uh, really the commonality is that you've got research embedded into an actual lab course where students are taking it for credit. Um, a group of folks who think a lot about cures got together a couple years ago and asked the question of what are the critical elements of cures, and they came up with these five dimensions. Um, scientific practices, that students are engaged in practices that are representative of what scientists do, so whether it's designing experiments or analyzing data uh, or creating posters, uh, kind of the real things that scientists do in, in the lab and, and in doing a research project. Uh, that cures should involve some kind of collaboration, that much of science uh, is collaborative. It's not single people working alone. Um, and building in elements of collaboration is important in a cure. Iteration, and we've, we've touched on this, this today as well, that you can't just do an experiment once. You can't interpret anything from that. You've got to repeat that experiment, and you've got to build on kind of prior results, prior literature, prior experiments that other students have done. That there's discovery, um, and and in this I'm defining it as no one knows the answer, right? It's truly novel. So as as Lee talked about, it's not just good enough that the students don't know the answer; it's that no one knows the answer. The broader scientific community doesn't actually know the answer. Um, and then there's broader impact or relevance that someone cares about the results beyond the walls of the course, um, beyond the confines of the course. And so I like to think about these five dimensions is what makes cures distinct from other types of lab courses. Um, and so if you think about kind of your traditional cookbook lab course, 
uh, where students are following a recipe, much like kind of a recipe in, in, a, in a cookbook, uh, a linear series of steps uh, to get the right answer. Um, students are often just focusing on scientific practices, and these are often pretty rudimentary scientific practices, right? Can they follow directions? Can they pipette? Uh, can they follow a series of steps to get the right answer? If they don't get the right answer, then they explain away why they didn't get the right answer, right? Write that up and then move on to the next thing, right? All of us are, are well aware of, of these types of lab courses. Um, and so the problem here is that they're not really engaged in a lot of scientific practices. Um, there's very, there's, there's essentially no iteration that's happening, no discovery, no broader relevance. There may be a little bit of collaboration, but often this collaboration is inauthentic. It's, we only have three uh, beakers, so we're going to share, and that's not exactly the type of collaboration that we want them to be, to be picking up on. So in contrast, uh, kind of our inquiry-based activities, kind of our one to two week inquiry-based activities, they often uh, focus a lot more on scientific practices, really getting students to think through designing their own experiments, analyzing a set of data, uh, you know, so coming up with their own kind of research questions at points. And there's that discovery element to it by definition to make it inquiry that, that what the students are proposing is novel. Um, but the example I like to give uh, for all of you microbiologists, is like the classic example is let's swab the inside of our mouth, the sole of our shoe, uh, and find out what's on it. And when Susie does this, uh, we have no idea what's on Susie's shoe. Susie doesn't know what's on Susie's shoe, right? She can figure out what kind of bacteria is on there. Um, but no one really cares, right, beyond really Susie, really anyone, right? Uh, so we could do it, and it's a great way for her to ask questions, and it's a great way to go through the scientific practice, but there's no broader relevance, and no one cares about it outside of the confines of, of the course. Um, and that's really where cures are, are distinct from inquiry-based activities, uh, in that there's discoveries that people actually care about, that the, there's these two pieces together. And I wrote a, a paper with a colleague of mine, Matt Closer, a couple years ago, where we talked about how, uh, so we went through and, and looked at these five dimensions, and we, we really argued that this discovery and broader elements, they're not actually two separate dimensions, they're really one dimension, um, that, that in a cure students are working on novel findings that have broader relevance. And this is when we use the term real research or authentic research, this is what we're really talking about, right? How do we actually know uh, that there's gonna be uh, broader relevance? Well, so our most conservative estimate is can you get a publication out of it? Uh, people have already talked about this today. You can get publications out of the work being done in Cures. Uh, there was a lot of hype last summer. Um, so ge the Genomics, Genomics uh, Education Partnership um, published a paper with over a thousand Cure student authors. Um, I think that this brings up some interesting ethical questions as far as whether all thousand authors contributed intellectually to this paper. I'm not gonna get into that, but what you can for sure say from this is that the work that students are working on in a Cure can, can lead to, to scientific publications. Um, however, you don't have to have a publication, right? Maybe it's more appropriate to have a database entry. Maybe you're working on a project that has broader relevance that's examining the water quality in a local stream. So a scientific publication isn't the appropriate venue. Rather, it's writing up some kind of community report. Um, and I wanted to reiterate that you don't have to actually publish it for it to be a cure. Uh, what matters is that someone outside of the course would actually care about the, the results. And we all know that failed experiments and negative results are a part of science. A lot of us are doing research and, um, and it never ends up being published. And that doesn't mean it's not real research, right? Um, and so it's the distinction of a cure is really the potential for someone else to, to build onto the findings. So this idea of kind of real research and authentic research in the context of a lab course uh, is really what, what segues me into thinking about faculty perspectives. Uh, and Lee set me up really well earlier to, to think about this. So that, that faculty can actually do research while they teach, right? That these uh, seemingly opposite kind of tasks that a lot of faculty have, uh, particularly faculty at a Research One institution or a comprehensive institution, um, or even small liberal arts colleges that have research as part of, of a faculty members' responsibilities, often it's you've got to do research and you've got to teach and you've got to find all the time in the day to do it. But here, cures really represent this opportunity for faculty to do, do the two actually simultaneously. So this started me on, uh, on a project um, looking at, at faculty who develop their own cures, what are their benefits and challenges to actually teaching a cure? What kind of motivated them to do that? What are they actually getting out of, of teaching a cure? And does it stem back to that kind of real research aspect? 
So we conducted a, a national study uh, of 38 faculty who have developed their own cure. So people have made the distinction uh, today of people who teach a cure that's developed by someone else, so similar to like the C-phages, um, and then people who have developed their, their own cure on their own. And so in this particular study, we just looked at faculty who developed their own cure. Often this was an extension of their own research project if they had a research active lab. Um, sometimes it was an extension of their PhD work or their postdoc work. Sometimes it was just a random idea that they had uh, that they wanted to develop, but, but they were the ones who actually took the, the initial research question and, and developed the, the cure out of that. Uh, we did semi-structured interviews uh, of faculty who are, were willing to participate. We basically sent out uh, to lots of different listservs um, with, uh, so there's a, a national organization called CureNet. Um, that, uh, that folks are associated with who teach cures. So we sent out uh, emails to them. We sent out emails to people involved in the biology education research community um, and tried to get out the word as much as possible. So we conducted interviews uh, electronically uh, over, over Skype and then uh, we transcribed the interviews. We anonymized them so participants would feel comfortable sharing uh, as honestly their, their thoughts as possible. And we actually analyzed the interviews uh, using a technique called grounded theory. So we basically let themes bubble up from the interviews. Uh, we didn't go in with kind of any preconceived ideas of exactly what they were going to say. Um, and the data that I'm going to show is we report out percentages of participants who mention something that would fit into a theme. And so I want to um, I want to point this out that it, 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 we only report out the percentage of the people who actually said something about that theme. It's not like they had a checklist and then they went through and actually checked off all the things that were important to them. So it's very likely with this type of research that you're underestimating uh, potentially a, a theme. Um, but this is, this is the kind of qualitative first step for this type of research. And then the next step would be to actually take these themes, develop some kind of survey, and then, and then get more, uh, more of the quantitative side of it. Okay, so we asked faculty a lot of questions, um, and I'm only going to present a subset of it today uh, based on time, but um, we asked them what challenges existed for them in developing cures, uh, and some of you have already alluded to some of these challenges um, in thinking about how to take what you heard earlier today and actually implement it into your own kind of labs and own institutions. Um, and so I want to walk through kind of the challenges that emerge from the data. So again, we're looking at percentages of the 38 faculty uh, who reported these, these challenges. So the number one challenge, not surprisingly, is logistics. Um, so faculty talked about getting students out to field sites. Faculty talked about um, that doing a, a cure often involves students at a bunch of different steps. So um, Christine talked about how there was a lot going on and there's complex things. And so often you have students at slightly different points. And so there's just a lot of logistical challenges whether it's how much are you prepping the samples or, or not. Um, and so that's just something to think about in terms of a challenge. Uh, faculty reported that there was significant time work investment, uh, more so than, than other types of lab courses. Um, they talked about how it takes a lot more one-on-one -on -one time with students because you're, you're adopting kind of that, that mentorship role in a way and, and it's a little bit more time intensive. Financial constraints got brought up, so it depends on institutions. Some institutions are richer than others. Um, and so at some institutions, all they got was a typical lab fee to try to run the course. And so um, they had to think about how much of the actual science and the research did they have to kind of sacrifice to be able to, to do it within that kind of budget. Other uh, institutions took on the approach of charging a really large lab fee um, to students. But then that brings up some ethical considerations of if you want this to be a a really good experience for students, but then you're only giving the students that can afford a $400 lab fee the opportunity to do that, then, then that may not, not be a good option. Um, faculty talked about the expanded role of the instructor, that they went from just being a teacher of a lab course uh, to being something more. So I like this quote, I think it illustrates it well, I have to really support the students and remind them it's okay if the data don't support the hypothesis. So there's a little bit of morale boosting and that's hard to sustain. So it seemed like in a lot of ways, faculty were taking on more of a cheerleader role, more of a, a supporter role, um, more of a, a mentor role, um, that they were wearing these kind of multiple hats. Faculty talked about research needing to be actually amenable to a cure, so not everything can be turned into a cure. Um, and so things to consider would be, uh, you know, if you're working on a project that involves kind of six-month 
mouse experiments, that's probably not going to be a good cure, um, right? So things that are shorter term, things that are potentially less costly, uh, things that you can set up kind of protocols where students maybe can, can collect data that's potentially publishable that are, is not super uh, technically challenging. So if you have something that the student would have to take like two months to learn how to do a technique, then that's probably not going to be a good cure project. Um, faculty talked about the uncertainty of research, uh, that it's risky, you have to be able to take on a lot of risk, you don't know if it's going to work in the end, you don't know whether the data that the students generate will actually be useful, so there's a little bit of having to deal with that uncertainty, that that's not the case in, in a cookbook lab, and, and that wasn't uh, as much of a case when they were talking about their inquiry-based courses. Mm -hmm. And then students talk, or faculty talked about kind of students' resistance overall, that, uh, that there be, and it often was in relation to this uncertainty of research, that if things didn't work out, that the students seemed to, to not be okay with that. Um, just kind of in passing, uh, faculty tend to report out that the top students often have some of the most trouble with this. They're used to having the right answer. They're used to being able to kind of get it all right. And then uh, when they start engaging in, in this research and they realize there is no right answer and we don't know exactly the next step, um, that that could be a little bit disconcerting. But yet, so all these challenges uh, they discuss, but yet all these faculty uh, have persisted in, in teaching these cures. And so, um, and so we asked them what benefits they got from the cure themselves. So I should point out that they talked a lot about student benefits, just broadly. Um, and I'm not reporting out the student benefits uh, for a couple different reasons. One is uh, these are all faculty perceptions of student benefits, and we don't actually know if the students actually benefited. Um, they could think that the students knew how to analyze data, but if they haven't actually tried to measure that systematically, then they don't really know. Um, and so here, these are all faculty perceptions of their own benefits, um, right? And so you could still, the next step would be to go and actually try to identify if they're actually getting these benefits, but we felt much more comfortable with their perceptions of their own benefits. So again, reporting out percentages of those 38 faculty who, who reported these benefits. So the top one that emerged were that cures connect teaching and research, right? So um, again, they're not these two kind of separate pillars that in the case of cures, faculty are being able to do research and teach at the exact same time. Um, and they felt like that was a huge benefit for themselves. Um, so you have a synergy between teaching and your research, which a traditional laboratory course doesn't, and we see it as a way to enhance our research through our teaching. Faculty talked about the kind of non-tangible, like enjoying uh, uh, teaching cures, um, that it benefited them because it's more fun. I find it boring if I do the same thing all the time, so I like the variety that it brings to the class. Uh, I thought that this was a really interesting idea because I think we often think about faculty motivations uh, in terms of tangible factors that are going to influence kind of promotion and tenure. And these faculty very much talked about, like, if I have to spend four hours in a lab, I want to do something that's going to be more fun and more enjoyable to me. And, 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 it, and it seemed to them that, that cures were going to do that. Faculty did talk about cures lending positively towards promotion and tenure, that it prioritized that teacher-scholar model, again, going back to that idea that they're being able to do research and teaching in the same, um, in the same setting. Um, and this was often alleviating issues of not having enough time to do things. They talk specifically about cures resulting in publications. They use the actual data from the class for publications. They talked explicitly about students collecting data for faculty research. Um, and then that could ultimately lead to publications. They talked about feeling fulfillment and satisfaction teaching this way, that I just feel good about doing it. I love the sharing the wealth, um, that intrinsically they just felt that this was a better way to actually teach for the students, um, not necessarily for themselves. There was a theme of teaching cures broadening their own research interests that came up. So uh, faculty talked about how they started for either from student ideas or student data, they would explore new pathways, uh, new kind of tangents. Um, they also discussed how it would, uh, it was a little bit more flexible in terms of there was less of a, a need for like a graduate student to really get a publishable unit out. They could take more risks in a cure and, and broaden their research interests because if they didn't get a publication out of what the undergrads collected, it wouldn't have been the kind of end of the world for them as opposed to a grad student. We talked about how it helps them get grant money and broader impacts, so NSF funding. Um, some faculty talked about that they integrated teaching and research in the context of career awards, and they used CURES in that context. Um, they recruited trained students to come into lab. Lee talked about this, um, that basically they get students jazzed up about the, the class and who they are as a mentor and, and their actual research project, and then they ended up recruiting them to join their research lab. 
It could connect uh, service aspects of scholarship. So depending on the cure, if it could have some kind of connection to the local community, whether it's like the urban uh, microbiome cure, um, it, in that, that could actually fulfill for some of these faculty their service expectations in addition to kind of their teaching and research expectations. And then they talked about how cures improve relationships with students, that I get to know the students a bit more than a typical cookbook kind of lab. We get to sit down and talk uh, like equals about their data. So that kind of downtime, that ability of, of not both of them, uh, not actually knowing what the end result is, it was kind of working all together. Uh, and so they seemed to, to feel that that helped the relationships. So going back to that very uh, top theme that emerged, that the connected teaching and research, um, I want to build on that a little bit more. So as Lee alluded to earlier today, uh, there's for sure uh, a tension between teaching and research that exists in, in a lot of academia, uh, particularly uh, from like an R1 vantage point. Um, and I, with my colleague uh, Kimberly Tanner, uh, wrote a paper a couple years ago where we talked broadly about uh, faculty pedagogical change and asked the question of why, despite these national recommendations to change the way we teach, to make it more student-centered and active learning and more problem solving, um, why aren't we actually changing the way we teach um, as faculty? And most people say it's a lack of training. We don't know how to actually do it. Most people say it's a lack of time. We don't have the time to actually do it. Uh, we don't have the incentives to do it. Their reward structure is set up so that faculty are rewarded for research and not necessarily teaching. But in this essay, we brought up this novel idea that uh, perhaps there's tensions with professional identity and that uh, most biology faculty uh, tend to have uh, more of a research identity as opposed to a teaching identity. And so if given extra time, if given kind of the opportunity to, to choose how to spend your time, uh, most faculty are gonna choose it to, to actually do more research as opposed to teaching and are not gonna be as connected with trying to improve uh, their teaching. Now, because you guys are all here right now, you probably don't necessarily fit into this category Category, but you might know colleagues that kind of fit into this. And so this is something we really grappled with, this like balance between teaching and research where often, and it really builds up from graduate school, right? That like in graduate school, teaching is this thing you do if you're not good enough to get this research scholarship, right? Or this research fellowship. Um, and, so, uh, and so what's great about cures is that faculty can integrate teaching and research in a cure, and even faculty with a really strong research identity can teach in ways that are aligned with the goals of vision and change, right? So this is in contrast to kind of that typical faculty member that we were talking about teaching a lecture course here. If you have a really strong research identity, great. You can actually develop a cure and, and teach it for your students. Um, we asked our, our faculty, the 38 faculty, um, who do you think would be good as a cure instructor? Um, what attributes would you actually need? And what emerged from the data is that they, faculty would need to have the ability to deal with uncertainty. They need to have a background in research. They'd be, they have to have really good research chops to be able to actually ask the question and guide students through this. And they had to have a willingness to put in time and effort. And notably absent was teaching experience, even though this is a lab course and, and faculty would be getting teaching credit for actually doing it. They didn't actually think you'd have to be a good teacher to teach a cure. Um, and so, so this, I think, is, is evidence that faculty who have successfully developed these cures may be these faculty with strong research identities, that um, I don't think that they don't care about teaching. I think that they do. But I think that first and foremost, when they're thinking about a cure, they're thinking about that research identity and what you need as far as research to be able to do it. OK, and so in my last couple minutes, I wanted to just highlight a couple tension points that potentially exist between faculty and students. So the vast majority of faculty uh, we're super positive about student benefits and talked about how students could really benefit from, from cures. But one faculty member said, students are my monkeys, they collect data for me, right? And this is a subset of people who took the time and effort to respond to an email that they didn't have to respond to, to sit down and have a 45 minute interview with people that, to get nothing in return. And so as cures become more and more popular and as more faculty start to take advantage of it, as more faculty start to realize that they can benefit from this, that the teaching doesn't have to just be teaching, it could be they could be getting research from the teaching. I worry that this tension point starts to emerge and that we have to really be conscious of, of what we want as far as students learning in a cure and what we want as far as students producing data for faculty benefit. And I think that the vast majority of cures that exist right now have that balance. But as we start to tip towards more and more people developing cures, we're going to get people that look at this and try to maximize it more so for their own benefit. So I think we just have to be articulate as far as what are our st uh, student learning outcomes from this, these cures. And where's the line, right? 
right? Is it that you teach students one technique and you have them repeat it again and again for 14 weeks to get really nice publishable data? Or is it that you take the time to make sure the students understand each step of the technique, right? Do you take the time to build in the opportunity for students to present a poster, even though that's not actually necessarily going to help you actually get more data out? Right, so it's just a tension point. There's no kind of villains or heroes here, but it's something we need to think about. Additionally, and this has gotten brought up uh, before, I wrote an uh, essay with Gita Bangra, a colleague of mine, where we talked about cures can make scientific research more inclusive. Not everyone gets to participate in undergraduate research, but increasingly, undergraduate research is becoming a prerequisite for graduate school and who gets to go on and become a scientist. And often, students don't even know about it. it don't, they don't know it exists. They don't have time to do it. They don't have the confidence to apply, to email. Um, and so if you require students to enroll in a cure as part of their normal curriculum, it decreases these student-level barriers and gives them the opportunity to get that taste of research and, and then potentially go on in it. Um, but this brings up another tension point if we're thinking about faculty benefits and research productivity because if you broaden student access to research with intro courses, those students by definition are going to be more novice students, right, with less experience, with probably less technical experience, less conceptual knowledge, and so more novice students probably are going to be producing less research. Um, and so if faculty are trying to maximize their research productivity, then maybe they'd rather be teaching kind of 400 level courses as opposed to 100 level courses, but then you're not going to get that benefit as far as access. There's also a tension point between teaching and research missions of an institution. If we're having students pay for lab fees, um, at, for course credit, but then that's also leading to knowledge generation for the institution, that brings up some questions of is it okay to basically be charging students to then create research um, when in every other situation we pay students to help do research, right? So, so again, like no clear solution, but just uh, something we should think about. And then something that I've been really fascinated about lately is there's a tension between research being totally unpredictable and meeting course objectives. So if we really want, and it's been said a bunch today, that we want students to experience the process of science and what it means to do research. Well, what it means to do research is sometimes I think I'm gonna have something done in June, and it's not done until December. But in a semester, you have to have kind of key, um, key points along the way where students have to be able to, to kind of do things. And so do you give up on their authentic authenticity of research by making them have data? But if they didn't actually get data, then do they grab data from someone else, but that's not authentic. But then they can have that process of analyzing their data. And so it brings up this point of, of what's important and, and what are we going to preferentially um, kind of benefit uh, in this setting. So with that, I just want to acknowledge the folks involved. I had a postdoc in my lab, Aaron Shortledge, who did the, the interview study in, in Gita Bhangra, and I'd welcome questions. I have a question then. Um, so, so you did a great job, I think, of, of sort of articulating and defining some of the differences between sort of inquiry and, 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 and research, right? And I think that, you know, I sense there's a tension there because institutions, uh, students, parents of, of students looking at college, you know, it's become a, a buzz to say we can offer research. And, and, uh, and I wonder if, you know, sometimes because of those pressures, some of those will be research courses as you described them, but maybe some of them will be more inquiry, I guess, Q, Q is as opposed to cures. And I just wondered if you'd comment on that. Yeah, so I think that's a really good point. I think that, um, and that's why I tried to actually articulate the differences between inquiry and cures, because I think a lot of people are calling inquiry courses cures, and they're, they're not cures by kind of these definitions of cures. Um, I think I, we as a community need to solidify our de definition of, of cures. I think some people would say that if students don't know what the answer is, it's a it's a cure, but um, if there's this need for actually the broader scientific community to build on it, then that, that won't work, right? Um, I will say that um, I think that, in, I think that uh, there has been this push towards cures away from inquiry, and research is like the buzzword, um, but a really high quality inquiry course could actually in many ways be better than a cure. And um, someone talked about it today, I don't remember who, but 
if we actually think about um, students designing their own experiments, it's really hard for a student to sit down and design an experiment that's going to lead to something potentially publishable. So in a lot of ways, cures have to narrow that, that opportunity for students to have kind of the plethora of options. And instead, often, if you look at a lot of cures, what the students are actually doing is they're analyzing data, right? Is they're, they're thinking about the implications of data. But the actual research question themselves, they're often not coming up with. And you think about it in grad school. Like even even your typical kind of molecular biology grad student, like, do they really come up with a research question or are they given kind of some possible options from their research mentor? But if, if that's an important thing, then we maybe need to build an inquiry course to do that. So that, that answer brings up a point for me, and I think you mentioned it earlier, that I think we need to keep in mind that these are courses for students. And my perspective is that them going through the process is really what's more important. And like you mentioned, it doesn't matter if it's ultimately publishable, it, it has the potential for that. And, and I do worry, as you do, that some of these, some faculty may approach these courses as students being monkeys. And if you can focus that, okay, it's the student experience really that you want to enhance and discovery can make them excited about it and you know all those good things you know any any tool is not a good tool if it's not implemented in the right spirit right. And properly and so maybe by focusing on the student process we can ensure that we're getting the outcomes we want mm -hmm. yeah like I, I totally agree right and I think that I'm very interested in faculty benefits as I think Lee is because I think this is a way to bring more people into this right but it's that we need to still keep in mind that these are courses that students are taking that, and they need to be first priority, right? One last question. Yeah, hi, Sarah, this is more of a comment, but I, I like that you brought up the tensions issue, especially I see two of them connected um, where, where someone might be inclined to use all those hands to just produce data, and then also the ethical issue of make, uh, having the students pay for all those resources, and I think that if we have a good definition or a definition we all agree on, or multiple definitions for different things, and we make people, um, you know, be really deliberate about their objectives and their assessment. Then, are you really doing this? And if you're not f fulfilling those criteria, then, then it is unethical. Then, mm -hmm. this is not a cure. Great that you're doing this, but it isn't this. And therefore, the funding comes in. You know, I mean, to be realistic about it, right? Because you need money for all these things. So, there being a structure that you're bringing up, I think, hopefully, would address some of those potential issues later on. Yep. Can I just make a real small p counterpoint, Graham? Mm -hmm. uh, and, that, and that is, I, I also think that the opposite of not changing the way you're teaching is going to be unethical um, in the sense if you are doing cookie cutter labs, if you are doing those things that really aren't teaching, but you're just getting a paycheck for and those types of things mm -hmm. while you go do your research, that's equally unethical, so. I, I would agree with that as well. <laughs> I think this is a terrific session this afternoon. I'd like to thank all of you for coming. I'd like to thank the speakers, not only for keeping on time, but for five absolutely superb presentations. So thank you very much.